Hello, everyone. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome, everybody, to the second day of the fifth Fortaleza Austral Spring School. My name is Luisa Melo, and I am the moderator of our event. First, I would like to inform you that there is a real-time translation, and the questions must be written in the chat. On the second day, it will be presented a comprehensive overview on oil spill investigation and impacts in marine ecosystems. This event is organized by the Postgraduate Program in Tropical Marine Science, together with the Institute of Marine Science of the Federal University of Ceará in Brazil, and the Atlantic International Research Center, the Air Center. In addition, this event has the collaboration of other postgraduate programs. First, I would like to pass the word to the Events and Network Manager of the Atlantic International Research Center, the Air Center, which provided technical and scientific support to our event, Catarina Paz Duarte. Um, olá a todos, um, bom dia, boa tarde. Um, eu gostaria só de reforçar também um bocadinho o que o meu colega José Montinho disse no primeiro dia, do, da satisfação que é para o Arcenta estar associado mais uma vez a Lobomar. Lobomar que tem sido o nosso parceiro desde, desde o início. Uh, é incrível o sucesso e o impacto que teve, que teve este evento. Estamos a falar que ontem, por exemplo, ontem tivemos cerca de 770 Uh, 777 um, visualizações, pessoas presentes a assistir ao, a este evento. Tivemos também uh, mais de 180 uh, visualizar, uh, visualizações no YouTube, portanto é incrível. Uh, eu queria também referir uh, que, o, que o impacto de, desta iniciativa não se traduz só no dia do, de ontem e de hoje. Uh, não posso referir a ideia que foi, que importante que foi criar o Inspire, este chapéu, digamos assim, à volta da formação nas áreas de marine science. Um, temos, vários, temos recebido vários contactos da nossa rede, de outros, de, de outros projetos, de, outros, de outras instituições em que se querem associar a esta iniciativa. Portanto, acho que em termos de futuro isto tem muito, muito para, para avançar, muito para fazer e muito para se alcançar. Uh, e pronto, só desejo mais, mais um, um dia de sucesso para, para este evento. E Luisa, força. Thank you, Catarina. I also would like to pass the word to the session coordinator, Dr. Laércio Lopes Martins, who is visiting professor at the postgraduate program in Tropical Marine Science of Labomar in University at the Federal University of Ceará. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome again to our Inspire. International Spring School in Marine Science. Yesterday, we had a successful event, learning from experts on plastic pollution from around the world, and the in-person student training for many students from the state of Ceará and other states of Brazil. But today, we will talk about another marine pollution, the pollution by oil. So it's a great pleasure today to open the session about oil spills and their investigation impacts in marine ecosystems. As we faced it in 2019 in Brazil, oil spills can lead to severe environmental problems, including contamination of aquatic ecosystems and shore areas, as we can see in this picture, socioeconomically affecting many coastal communities. The 2019 oil spill is the largest oil spill ever recorded in tropical oceans. This tragedy revealed the economic vulnerability of the northwest coast of Brazil. And oil material is still keeping coming to the coast of Brazil, as occurred in January 2022, when around 8,000 liters of spilled oil reached several bits of the state of Ceará. A recent work from our research group on oil spills here at the Marine Science Institute at the Federal University of Ceará showed that this event is not related to the oil spill in 2019. And again, more oil material like tar balls start to reach the northwest coast of Brazil in August starting to strengthen the beaches of Ceará in September. Until now, 
more than 60 pits were affected, with various tons of oil already collected. So, we have experienced enormous environmental and socio-economic impacts of oil spills. To face this problem that is so close to us, we need sound science. To assist the cleanup of the oil, measure and monitor the impacts, help the recovery of the ocean, and support the coast communities. From this need, arise or inspire International Spring School in Marine Science. And together with this significant event, we have at this time six great international research working on oil pollution that are here today to share their knowledge with us. In the first session, we will have Dr. Joe Fodre, Dr. Johnny Beyer, and Dr. Lisa Ritchie to bring to us their insights on environmental effects and impact of oil in marine ecosystems and coastal communities. The second session will have Dr. Jagos Hadovic, Dr. Christopher Reddy, and Dr. Paul Philp to talk to us about how to research oil pollution in water, sediments, and biotic components. So thank you very much to them for kindly accepting our invitation. I also thank you everyone to be here with us. I wish you all a nice event. All things considered, now I will open the first session, theme environmental effects and impact of oil in marine ecosystems and coastal communities, with Dr. Talita Cruz Lopes Tavares Normando, a researcher at Labomar, as chair of the session, and the speakers Dr. Joe Frodry, Dr. Johnny Bayer, and Dr. Lisa Ritchie. There will be all three speakers' presentations in a row and then a 20-minute discussion where the questions from the audience will be answered by the speakers. The session will begin with Dr. Joe Fodry with the presentation entitled Response of Coastal Fish to Basin Scale Oiling. Dr. Fodry is professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an estuarine ecologist who studies the population dynamics of fish fishes and shellfish, as well as the community ecology within coastal biogenic habitats. His research examines linkage between habitats and fisheries production, movement ecology, coastal marine food web interactions, and energy flows, and long-term popula long population and community responses to natural human-influenced perturbations. Dr. Fodry earned his PhD from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in 2006, his Bachelor in Biology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1999, and was a postdoctoral researcher at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. He has contributed to almost 100 peer-reviewed papers that explore mechanisms of population and community variability within coastal ecosystems. Dr. Joe Fodry, the screen is yours. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I want to share my screen. Okay. So I, I was a postdoc at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab in coastal Alabama, which uh, sits right here, if you can follow my uh, pointer. And uh, I moved there in 2006 and was doing research. And of course, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred in 2010. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is really uh, 15 to 16 years of me being involved in different aspects of oil spill research with specific focus on the coastal fishes, largely estuarine fishes. Um, there are many other aspects of the system, um, marine mammals, marine birds, uh, the deep water component of this spill, 
um, which is outside the, the scope of, of the data that I gather and, and analyze. So I'm very myopically focused on coastal fishes. Um, and I would like to uh, couch uh, oil spills in uh, the framework of marine disturbance. Um, we are perturbing coastal systems and oceanographic systems in many ways. Um, oiling is one of them, um, climate change, habitat alteration, fishing, other forms of pollution, including noise pollution increasingly. Um, and the way that I view oil spills is largely as a pulse disturbance, um, shown here graphically. So as we go through time, something like an oil spill is, is going to be a, a disturbance to the system. Um, there's an impact stage and a recovery stage. Um, we can measure the duration of that pulse event, the magnitude of the pulse event, the recovery time of a system. But it's a discrete event. We can sort of talk about the beginning date and the end date. Um, we can study the acute phase injuries or the chronic phase injuries of this pulse event. But the oil spill itself, to me, is, is best framed as a pulse-type disturbance. And at the end of this talk, um, I want to come back to, to the way that I view, again, for just coastal fishes, uh, the impacts of of pulse and press disturbances. And the presses are the things that are just kind of always there leaning on the system, uh, maybe at times more in the background. Um, the pulses uh, usually show up in the newspapers immediately, oil spills, hurricanes, um, large fires. Uh, the presses uh, also show up in the press, but sometimes it's a little more muted and it's kind of hard to, to say this was the key date or this was the key event when it's a press. But so I'm framing up marine oil spills, uh, certainly the deep water horizon oil spill as a, as a pulse that happened to the system um, in 2010. It was a very large pulse. It was a pulse that affected most of the northern Gulf of Mexico, of course. Um, here are a few details about the deep water horizon oil spill. I'm sure many of which you know. Um, over the course of about three months, uh, around 5 million barrels of oil um, leached into the northern Gulf of Mexico, and you can see somewhat of the extent of coastal oiling here, um, really from Louisiana, maybe all, all the way into Texas, and certainly into the Florida Panhandle, also hitting Mississippi and Alabama. And we knew going into the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that oil could have large impacts on coastal fishes. Um, just the physical gumminess and sludginess of oil can damage um, the ability of fish to produce slime, which protects them. It can certainly affect their gills, which they use for breeding and for feeding in some cases. Uh, beyond that physical gumminess, uh, PAHs can result in genetic damage, physiologic cost, um, altered development, reproductive cost. And these damages can occur at fairly low in, uh, concentrations of these toxic PAHs. Uh, we knew this from previous oil spills, um, and it's thought that the effects of oil, again, can be both acute, you know, the oil can, can uh, be on a bird or a fish and, and kill that individual, but there's also pathways in which the effects can be chronic. Um, oil can be sequestered and then slowly leach out of sediments or underneath rocks. Um, some of these instabilities that may start off with uh, oiling can, can propagate for years and then manifest later. So you have to worry about the acute phase and the chronic phases. These were all things that sort of other oil spills, um, and in the case of um, our work, certainly the Exxon Valdez oil spill in the very late 80s had informed about what we might expect for coastal fishes as the Deepwater Horizon spill was happening. So oil can affect fishes sort of directly. I mentioned that. Um, but oil can affect fishes in other pathways too. Uh, it can damage the habitats on which the fishes rely. That would seem to be bad for, for fish and other animals. Uh, oil in this case could also uh, impact higher order animals like birds and larger fishes. These are predators of small coastal fishes. Um, so how does that end up affecting or manifesting in terms of fish numbers? Oil can affect the, the food chain. Uh, in the case of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we knew that phytoplankton were responding to the oil. Phytoplankton is the base of the food web for a lot of these fishes. In the case of the Deepwater Horizon spill, uh, fishing got turned off. 
So what happens when you impact fish with oil, but you turn off another impact, maybe this more press impact that's always happening to fishing. And of course, all of these oil related impacts are happening um, during a period where we're having these other effects such as coastal development, climate change. And so uh, over 15 years, I've had a lot of questions for this talk. I'm really sort of focused on one question, I suppose, and that is, how can we boil down all these different effects, these complex pathways and say what happened with fishes? And I will note here, this is important for the next few minutes, is that um, some people study the effects of oil like on individual fish. Um, and I think we, we have a really good handle on what those expected impacts are. I tend to work more at surveying populations and looking at community ecology. And so a real question is when we start hurting individual fish um, with oil, how does that propagate or attenuate as you move up towards populations of fish or communities of fishes? So we spent a lot of time thinking about that is how do we, how do we um, understand the effects of oil in this hierarchical sense as we move from individual to population, to community, to ecosystem. So I'm gonna start with some other people's data. Uh, this is not mine, but this was a very nice paper. Um, it should have been PNAS, so obviously a, a very strong journal. And it was focused on the response of uh, the Gulf killifish to oiling. And what these researchers did is, um, as the, the oil spill was happening and they knew what was coming to the coast, they went out and sampled a bunch of different marsh habitats along the Northern Gulf of Mexico coastline. So they got there before the oil arrived. And then some of their sites they visited got oiled and they went back to all their sites after the oil arrived. So they have both before and after oiling, they have um, impacted sites and non-impacted sites or control sites. And this is what's called a Baki design, before, after, control, impact. And this is thought to be a really nice design for trying to make sure that you're untangling the effects of an event like oiling from inherent differences in sites. So these are two sites they visited, um, GT and BLB, um, just two sites along the Northern Gulf. They went out before oil arrived, after oil arrived, and a few months after oil arrived. And so this is a site that actually received oil in time and this site never received oil. And I've just taken a photo here from their paper where you're looking at the gill tissues of this fish, um, the Gulf killifish, and these gills look very healthy. It was an unoiled site. Before the oil arrived, the gills at this site look very healthy, but after oil arrived, you start seeing a change in the gills. This is like smokers lung or the oil actually impacting the gills. And so this is, you know, thought to injure the fitness of this fish. And in addition to this sort of histology, they looked at uh, genetic markers, they looked at physiological markers, and they saw a suite of negative impacts of oil on this individual fish. Really well done study. Fishes were taken from the field. Um, has a lot of power, I would think. Uh, another paper published in PNAS, again, looking at the effects of oil on individual fish. In this case, it's the larvae of, and I'll have to apologize, it's either uh, a fish like mahi or amberjack, it's sort of a, um, a large coastal fish if you migrate pretty far. Um, but here is a, uh, a fish that was not introduced to oil and it has a nice eye, it has a very healthy yolk, um, the dorsal cord looks very healthy. Um, I can't quite make it out, but there's a heart in here that seems to be normal. Uh, by comparison, this was a fish that was introduced to oil. Um, the eye is not developed properly. The yolk isn't developed properly. The dorsal cord seems to have some torsion in it. This is not a healthy fish. Um, you could certainly imagine this fish is, is not going to do well. And if all the fishes out there are seeing this oil and at low concentrations are responding, uh, you might be very concerned about the health of fishery stocks in this system. On the other hand, uh, I do a lot of survey work, and I was surveying in 2006, 7, 8, 9 before the oil spill, and of course then we surveyed after the oil spill. And uh, all you need to know is these are the 20 most common seagrass-associated fishes that we find in the northern Gulf of Mexico. It's different taxa of fishes. And these are the catch rates before the spill, and these are the catch rates after the spill. And this is the key column. Did we see decreasing numbers of fish, no change in fish, 
or even increasing numbers. And remarkably, all we ever find is for 12 of the species, their numbers went up after the oil spill. And for the other eight species, their numbers didn't change in a statistically meaningful sense. Uh, these graphs here are a representation of community structure in different places like Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Alabama, and Florida. And the fact that all these dots are falling on top of each other, including the black dots, which are after the oil spill, just means that we did not see a change in community composition. Everything suits up here to say the basic same after the spill. We just saw more fish. Uh, here's another study from Louisiana where a lot of marshes did get oiling. Um, here's that same Gulf Kelly fish, one of the marsh fishes that we studied. We went to all of these sites uh, in Louisiana marshes, some of which received oil, some of which didn't. In this case, we didn't have before data, so we don't have a full Baki. We just have a control versus impacted site study. But we had 15 or 20 control sites and 15 or 20 impacted sites. And it's a very similar thing. If you look at unoiled sites versus oiled sites for different fish, it's really hard to see a, a change, a negative change in the numbers of fish through time. So a quick survey of everybody's publications, and this is a bit dated. I probably updated this last a few years ago. But you can go look at over 30 papers where people are looking at the effects of oil on individual fish. And whether they're looking at genomic responses or physiological responses or reproductive cost, you're almost always seeing an effect. 97% of the time, they see a negative effect. And these are good studies. These are very legitimate, real studies. Some are in the lab, some are in the field. It's different types of fishes. I don't doubt these studies. That's not the point here. When people go look at populations of fishes in response to Deepwater Horizon, uh, at the time I did this, there were over 10 published studies looking in marsh systems, seagrass systems, open bay systems, off of beaches. Um, it covers over 120 species of estuarine or coastal fish. In those studies, you see stable or increasing numbers post Deepwater Horizon in 99% of the cases. And if we bring in some crustaceans like crabs and shrimps, it's the same basic thing. At the organismal level, individuals show cost. At population levels, the numbers tend to go up. So there's something really interesting happening here uh, that makes our life both exciting as scientists to try to figure out what is going on with this and a bit frustrating because we would like to be able to tell the, the public in one clear voice, this is the impact of oil. But your conclusions about the impact of oil do seem to be a bit um, influenced by the type of study you do. Is it you know organismal or is it field-based? or population-based. I can't go through this full table. Um, it's kind of complicated. I apologize for the length of it. But we thought of two classes of categories in which we were seeing this response of population versus organism. First is, is that there are really negative impacts of oil, but we just can't detect it at population levels for some reason. Maybe because of high spatial variability, maybe because of fishing closures, maybe because of offsetting food web cost. There are some mechanisms by which even if individuals are harmed, populations shouldn't change. These are things like compensatory processes or the ability of fish to just avoid oil in ways that we don't fully understand. And so we've tried to tack off a number of these to see if they appear to be plausible or not. I'm just going to talk about two quickly in the interest of time. Uh, and it's really going to be these two here. Um, what if there were offsetting effects in the food web so that oil was a source of mortality, but we decreased some other source of mortality? And then fishing closures, which has certainly got a lot of attention in different papers as well. We build a, a marsh food web. Obviously, this is pretty complicated. Marsh food webs are complicated. Uh, there's producers down here. There's sort of your... your uh, top little predators and consumers up here. What this table shows is how connected or how important are different members of this food web. And then over here on this axis, you're looking at how sensitive are those members to oil. Um, and we gather data from the literature to try to build this figure. And the fishes, they don't appear to be that sensitive to oil. But what does appear to be sensitive to oil? Well, crabs are pretty sensitive and they'll eat small fish. Birds are really sensitive to oil. They'll eat small fish. 
dolphins are really sensitive. They'll eat small fish. So we do think there is some, there's some decreased natural mortality because you've lopped off a lot of the normal predators um, on these fishes, mostly the birds and the dolphins and maybe some turtles uh, and crabs. The effect of turning off fishing. Um, and again, fishing is like a press in its own right. And so uh, what you're looking at here first are a time series of commercial harvest in the Northern Gulf of Mexico um, before the oil spill. The oil spill happened right here. So these are sort of commercial sales and commercial landings uh, and participation. How many license holders? This is where they're catching fish across five states in the Northern Gulf. And so we went into this uh, thinking, well, uh, oil may have big negative effects on the communities that fish, um, not only the, the fishes themselves, but the fishing communities. And there were a couple of early papers that suggested that over the course of a decade, the oil spill might cost Gulf fisheries upwards of close to $10 billion, you know, anything from $2 billion to $10 billion. So we really thought we'd see fishing tank, and we did leverage turning off fishing as one explanation for why fish numbers just didn't crash after the spill. We had turned off this other source of mortality. So we went in thinking that fishing would sort of drop off after the spill. And in reality, this is what commercial fishing did after the spill. It went up. Um, and in some ways, we think this reflects that there were still plenty of fish in the Gulf of Mexico and shrimp. Um, really, what happened is a, a ton of people joined the fishery. These are the, they're the participation data. And we think this is in some ways related to the fact that there were tons of damage payments. So if you add up all of this money across 20 years, it's something on the order of like 10 or $12 billion of sales of commercial fishing um, you know, weights. Damage payments probably scaled eight to $12 billion that were made to these fishermen. Um, and so we think that fishermen were able to sort of retool and reinvest in their gears and, and incentivize other people to get into the fishery. And so, yeah, we didn't see a collapse of fishing after the spill. We saw an expansion. And this is a press that's now happening in the Gulf of Mexico. And we don't net yet know, I think, what the effects of this press of leaning on the fishes more with higher fishing really will be. Uh, there is a model for this response. Uh, it's not so crazy that we saw this. So uh, in terms of how economies respond to a disaster, sometimes there are losses. Sometimes there are temporary losses with recovery. The recreational sector in the Gulf showed this. Um, sometimes there's actually this response here where things go up and it's sometimes called creative disturbance or creative destruction. And we do think that's kind of manifesting in the Gulf. All right, so to, to close up, um, I just wanna come back to these press and pulse disturbances. The oil spill was a pulse disturbance. Um, other types of disturbances like this are hurricanes for coastal fishes, increasingly seismic surveys that sort of go through an area one time, they blasting sound. All the data that I see suggests that fishes, uh, and just talking about fishes, coastal fishes, they're fairly resilient. They are resistant even. They don't show big swings to these types of pulse disturbances. Um, and it's not just the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, even in the Exxon Valdez oil spill, maybe only Pacific Herring uh, crashed, and that's still debated. The Jessica oil spill in the Galapagos, the Santa Barbara Basin oil spill, populations of fishes typically come through those pretty well. I actually am more worried about the press disturbances, the slow warming, the constant fishing, the slow creep of habitat loss, chronic noise pollution. The papers that I look at those show the effects. And so um, certainly uh, I don't want to say the Deepwater Horizon had no impacts. It had dramatic impacts in a lot of ways. Coastal fishes are showing us something interesting and unique uh, that I think is worth keeping an eye on and you leveraging to explore how um, these systems will respond to all the disturbances that we're, that we're uh, producing in these systems. Uh, thank you for listening, and I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Frodry, for your excellent presentation. Now, the second speaker is Johnny Bayer, Dr. Johnny Bayer, with the presentation entitled Environmental Effects of the Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill. Dr. Bayer is an 
marine environmental scientist with specialty in biological effects markers, biomarkers, applied in ecotoxicological effect assessments and monitoring of various kinds of industrial pollution. He has worked more than three decades in this field and has authored and co-authored about 150 scientific reports and articles, several of which have become internationally influential. He has broad experience as research project manager and as a teacher, and also ser serves as an expert advisor to the Norwegian environmental authorities. So thank you, and you can start. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, um, Johnny Bayer from uh, Niva here in Oslo in Norway. Uh, and I'm going to uh, to make a presentation um, about uh, the, the research uh, done after the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill. Uh, and this was uh, um, um, uh, uh, work that uh, that uh, was funded by uh, Norwegian um, Oil and Gas Association. Uh, and the aim uh, of that was to learn from uh, the research done after the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill, uh, in order to to also be pr better prepared for uh, in case uh, similar accidents happen in Norwegian waters, but because uh, uh, Norway is also a major uh, oil and gas producer, uh, and we were very interested in. Um, what would be the, the ecological effects after the Deepwater Horizon? So, so that work started in uh, 2012, um, where we uh, tried to collect all the information that was published uh, after Deepwater Horizon. Uh, and after a while, we, we decided to, to make a paper of it. And, and this review paper you see here, uh, is uh, open for everybody to to download if you if you like, uh, and uh, and I'll come back to that later as well. Uh, just a little bit introduction. Um, like uh, Dr. Fodery here also talked a lot about the Deepwater Horizon, and and that's a good reason for that uh, because uh, the Deepwater Horizon is the largest um, accidental marine oil spill in history. Uh, but it's also a record breaker in, in several other ways as well. Um, it is uh, the deepest blowout uh, that, uh, that have uh, occurred um, on more than 1,500 meters depth. Um, and it's also the most expensive uh, accidental marine oil spill in history. Uh, when I say accidental uh, oil spill, there are others that are bigger, when they, uh, for example, in the Persian Gulf after, after the the the, um, the, the war in in Kuwait, uh, but um, but that was not an accidental spill. That was a deliberate spill. But the Deepwater Horizon is the biggest one, uh, and there is a little uncertainty of how big it actually was. Uh, the maximum estimates it's um, uh, up to seven hundred and eighty thousand cubic meters uh, of oil uh, but the, the agreement in the in the in the legal case were at uh, 500,000 cubic meters uh, uh, for the for the problem owner BP uh, the, the cost of, uh, of this uh, oil spill uh, in 2016 was uh, at uh, 62 billion um, US dollars uh, and uh, and uh, those money were going for funding the, the accidental response and the cleanup, but also a lot of research projects. So, and that is also the, the, the next record that um, Deepwater Horizon has, and that is the most studied oil spill ever. It is not only the, the most studied oil spill, but it's actually the most studied uh, single pollution event. Uh, and the information um, that have been pr produced uh, after the, this oil spill is actually quite staggering. Uh, and it's uh, also a challenge to kind of 
uh, keep track of everything. Um, and this slide here uh, shows the, the web page of uh, the Deepwater Horizon Project Tracker website. Uh, and that is a really good website for those that are interested in getting information from, from uh, this oil spill. Um, this map here shows all the uh, projects that have been done after Deepwater Horizon. Uh, the blue dots are environmental studies. So what you, what you can see clearly is that it, there are a huge number of research projects that have been done. Uh, and uh, and uh, many of these research projects have ended up in publications. So, so uh, to keep track of all the information is quite challenging. So my, my um, most important message today will, will actually be um, suggesting how we can keep this kind of massive information well organized. So we'll come back to that in a later slide. Uh, when we look at the, the number of publications that, uh, that have been published in, in uh, peer-reviewed re journals, um, when we made the, 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 the review paper, uh, there were uh, around 800 articles published. Today, the number is uh, 1,700, um, uh, 1,700, uh, and, um, and that is uh, only articles um, uh, addressing various kinds of uh, environmental effects. Uh, also, a lot of other technical papers that are going on, uh, how to avoid uh, blowouts, etc. But uh, for the environmental studies, which we are focusing here today, uh, we are talking about um, 1,700 articles published. Uh, and still, there are actually coming 100 papers, uh, new papers on environmental issues uh, each year. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not stopped. Um, so looking a little bit for, first on, the, on the, um, the, the blowout itself, um, one unique thing with, with the, the, the Deepwater Horizon blowout was the depth. Uh, it uh, occurred at, the, at more than 1,500 meters. Uh, and that is also uh, making it uh, very difficult to to uh, to stop in case um, uh, in in for for the for the response team, so but uh, so the the process on killing the blowout is actually a extremely uh, exciting story in itself, and it's uh, I, I must give big credit to the to the team that managed to do it because it, that was really not easy. Uh, another thing with with the uh, depot horizon was the the persons uh, that um, were used uh, to reduce the amount of oil uh, that uh, um, uh, went to the sea surface. Uh, so uh, these uh, dispersions were added uh, for the first time uh, down at the the um, uh, oil stream coming out on 1500 meters. Uh, and that was uh, to, to, to uh, keep the, the oil droplets that were coming out in the, in the sea water to keep them small. If you can sp uh, keep them small, you, you avoid that they have the, the buoyancy uh, of the bigger, bigger oil droplets. Uh, so, so you are um, track, uh, you are, you are um, avoiding them to, to rise to the, to the surface. And that worked actually quite well. But um, it is also important to know that uh, there were also added uh, dispersions at the, at the sea surface. Uh, and uh, it was actually added more uh, in volume at the sea surface uh, compared to at the deep waters. But uh, when we look at the fate, uh, of, uh, of the oil spill. Um, it was clearly uh, that um, this uh, slide here sh uh, shows the accumulated um, area uh, where uh, oil were detected on the sea surface. That is the black uh, color here. Um, and, uh, and clearly you can see that the accumulated area is quite substantial. Um, the coastal areas that were impacted were actually more than uh, 2,000 
kilometers of coastline that were uh, impacted either um, uh, heavily or moderately or just slightly. Uh, more than 200, uh, sorry, more than 2,000 kilometers of coastline. So it's a big, big oil spill. Um, and, and it's also important to remember that uh, a marine oil spill is always um, uh, having larger impact when it reaches the, the shoreline. Uh, the dispersant adding that, that we saw on the previous slide uh, kept much of the oil uh, down in deep waters. So what you can see um, from the, from, uh, from the uh, middle part of, of this slide is that that is a big area where the deep water um, bottom uh, was uh, contaminated with, uh, with um, degrading oil from the spill. And that was also uh, one of the main concern, uh, how this um, um, oil that spread on deep waters, how that would impact the ecosystem down, down there. Uh, but um, still it's uh, important to remember that the reason uh, for um, using the dispersions was to avoid uh, oil from reaching the surface. Uh, and and uh, if you could avoid that, you would also avoid the oil from reaching the shore, uh, which uh, the, obviously uh, is uh, associated with, with increased impact if uh, the more oil that reaches the, the shore. Uh, although there are some uncertainty um, about uh, actually how much of the oil that, uh, that uh, made landfall, um, there is uh, pretty much uh, agreement that uh, it was less than 15% of the spilled oil, and possibly even um, as low as only 4% of the spilled oil made landfall. So that means that, uh, that even though um, Deepwater Horizon was a really big oil spill and, and a big disaster, um, it could have been much bigger as well if, uh, if the surfacing of the oil um, was, uh, was not avoided. So um, that is also uh, then, of course, an uh, important aspect for uh, learning how to deal with this kind of, uh, of uh, oil spill events, whether or not to use dispersants. Um, and when we look at the, then the, the type of impacts that um, the, the spill uh, had, uh, the deep water uh, ecosystem was one of the ecosystems that were uh, quite un unknown how they will, would respond to, to this oil spill. And especially uh, deep water corals uh, were in focus. Um, the, the pictures that you see here uh, is from a um, sea fan coral, um, more than um, uh, 10 kilometers uh, from the, the uh, blowout site. Uh, and this uh, was a, a coral that was um, in the plume uh, from, uh, from the deep water horizon. Uh, and uh, what you can see here is uh, the, the same coral uh, taken picture uh, in um, November, about a uh, half year after the spill and up to uh, one and a half year later. Uh, and uh, clearly we, we see that there was um, kind of a, 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 um, a change uh, of the situation uh, at this uh, four uh, or five, um, uh, time points, uh, and uh, the the more acute phase were, were um, the oily flocks uh, covering uh, the coral, but uh, but the coral uh, was uh, was um, alive and and doing uh, quite okay uh, at that point, and and we can also see that it has this uh, this epibiont, the brittle stars, uh, which is on a normal trait for a sea fan coral. Uh, and as, as the, the um, uh, effects were kind of um, going more into the more chronic effects, uh, you saw the, the coral started to die. And, uh, and after um, or at the last um, 
serve at the point. Um, there was a lot of, of, of corals that, that had um, bare branches, uh, and also that uh, the epibiont hydroids were, were lost. Uh, it, is, it was not only the deep water corals that, that um, showed impacts, also shallow water corals did, uh, such as from, from um, the Pinnacle Strand area. Uh, we saw uh, uh, up to 10 times increase of the injuries uh, of the corals uh, due to the oil spill. Uh, the dispersions um, that were used were, were um, to, to reduce the amount of surfacing of oil, but, uh, but uh, close to the coast, they, they uh, were not using dispersions. Uh, and that was uh, also a, a matter of, of choice. Um, and uh, when oil comes into the coast, uh, the, um, the response team has to decide uh, what kind of habitats do you want to protect? Uh, and in case of Deepwater Horizon, they, they decided not to use dispersants uh, in order to protect the, 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 the coastal coral reefs and the seagrass beds. So the oil were, were then uh, staying uh, on the surface more uh, and moving into the marshes. Uh, and um, if you then uh, had, had uh, used the other uh, alternative as uh, adding, adding dispersants, you would then, of course, um, expose the coral, the shallow corals, and the seagrass beds, which are ecological really important. Uh, but the, the the marsh grass areas were impacted, but they are also um, uh, seen as uh, as uh, quite um, robust and, and resilient towards oiling, um, even though you also saw some degradation in the most um, impacted sites, as you see up here at the, at the left side. But uh, in general, uh, it took um, about uh, two to three years of, the, of those sites that were heavy oiled to recover. Um, Dr. Fodry also were mentioning the, the effects in fish. Uh, and... Uh, and um, this slide here is focusing on um, maybe the, the most um, uh, important um, uh, type of uh, impact that fish um, get for, from our oil spill, and that is the, the um, uh, cardiac uh, or cardiotoxic effects. Uh, typically uh, by, by um, alkylated phenantrans, uh, and, and that uh, is, is, is seen as um, uh, edema that are developing on different um, uh, places in fish larvae. Um, and, and these kind of conditions are uh, detrimental to the fish. And that is in particular for those fishes that, that are um, bigger and, and fast, fast swimmers. Uh, and it, uh, for the larvae, it can uh, cause uh, acute uh, mortality, but also for in case the, lar the larvae um, survives, the mortality can also come later. So you can have a delayed mortality in when the uh, fish is bigger. Uh, the big uh, species, uh, such as the red drum that you see up here on the right, uh, but also other big species like uh, the amberjack and the tuna and the mai mai as well, all those fishes are relying on uh, speed in order to uh, catch food. Uh, so, so they are also having um, a great need for capacity to, uh, to um, transport uh, blood uh, in order to, to keep the muscles running properly. So um, the big fish, uh, high-speed swimmers, they are extra, extra sensitive to this kind of impact uh, from oil. Uh, in, the, in the northern Gulf of Mexico, uh, more than 50% of the seafood revenue in USA comes uh, from that area. Uh, and uh, and uh, after the Deepwater Horizon, it, it was a big concern about uh, how the, um, this uh, uh, important uh, fishing sector would survive. Um, but um, also, as uh, Dr. Podry showed, 
uh, the impact was actually much less than what the, the most concerning predictions uh, was just after the oil spill started. At that point, the, 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 uh, a lot of uh, both researchers, but also other concerned stakeholders were considering that uh, there will be a catastrophic ecological effects for a long, long time in uh, the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but uh, fortunately, that did actually not happen. Uh, even though all this research show that clearly we have a lot of impacts, but uh, not that um, catastrophic as uh, the prediction, the early predictions were. But for the seafood sector, it was also interesting that, um, that um, only the suspicion of uh, that the seafood could be contaminated was actually enough to uh, to close down the market. So it is also a, a question: um, What kind of um, data do you need in order to keep um, uh, the confident um, for the seafood um, up to a level where where people would like to buy seafood from from this kind of area? Uh, and uh, that is also important uh, in case of Norway, my country, because we are we also have a lot of uh, marine fisheries, and and there is a big concern that if there is a oil spill, these uh, big marine fisheries can also suffer um, from um, loss of market confidence. So it's important to to to, to um, provide good documentation of whether the seafood is safe to eat or to. To and allowed to um, to sell after this kind of events, but it's also illustrating the economical impact uh, that, that can um, that can hit uh, um, big sectors like the seafood fisheries. Uh, of the other um, uh, animal groups that that were uh, mostly impacted uh, from deep water horizon, it was in particular the the seabirds. Uh, like uh, the laughing girl, uh, which uh, lost um, a third of the total population in the in the northern Gulf of Mexico, um, but also the sea turtles were were uh, one of the uh, groups that were most uh, concerned um, associated with, uh, and um, and they also suffered a lot. Uh, simulations indicated possibly uh, as many as 300,000 sea turtles uh, could have been affected after the spill. Uh, another um, key um, organism group was the, was the marine mammals, and in particular, the bottlenose dolphin population in the northern Gulf of Mexico um, have been a lot um, uh, researched on. Um, and, uh, and, um, that brings us uh, over to uh, my uh, last slides, uh, where we are going to um, take a look at how to or, uh, keep uh, information produced by researchers uh, after uh, an oil spill event like this, how to keep that uh, well organized. Um, if we go back to the dolphins, um, we can um, see here our, our, our bottlenose dolphin. And uh, in the in the in the coastal area of uh, Louisiana, you have um, uh, Barataria Bay. I hope I pronounce it uh, correctly. Uh, that population has been, in particular, much studied. Uh, when you look at uh, a big oil spill, uh, it is uh, necessary to to uh, know that you have early acute um, effects typically uh, associated with, with the, the increased exposure to contaminants uh, and increased exposure of various kinds of biota. Uh, various biota will, will be exposed in different ways. So you, know, you need to know uh, how, oil, um, how the fate of oil in a marine uh, system is. Um, because uh, if you are... Um, if you want to uh, to uh, modulate the fate by using dispersions, you are also uh, kind of deciding what kind of ecosystem habitat is, is going to be exposed to the oil. Um, so you need to follow um, trying to, to, to avoid 
that the oil is hitting the most sensitive uh, parts of the ecosystem. Uh, this uh, illustration here is I, I, I like quite much because it's also illustrating the, the timeline where, where you have uh, the early effects uh, in the center of, of this circle here, um, where the exposure increases. Um, and, uh, and then as the time goes, you will have um, a propagation of, uh, of uh, ecotoxicological phenomena occurring. Uh, at various levels of uh, ecological organization, ending up ultimately in population and community effects. Um, if we look at the, at the, the total um, knowledge that have been produced by the researchers after uh, Deepwater Horizon, this slide here is uh, tr uh, trying to uh, summarize everything. Uh, so you can say that um, this slide is kind of um, trying to uh, show our accumulated knowledge picture uh, from hundreds of, uh, of um, articles uh, where you can uh, put every, every type of um, um, effect parameter into the uh, kind of uh, ecological context or the, the multi-level hierarchical context that, uh, that are uh, our impact situation, ecological impact situation can be described by. So again, the, the early effects is about um, how the different exposures uh, increases when oil is, uh, is being released to the sea. You have also various other factors that, that influences um, the fate of the oil and also the stress or the, that the different organism group uh, experience. Those are shown here in green. But then uh, the, the circles outwards is kind of uh, showing uh, the various levels of, uh, of impacts uh, that is relevant to, to consider, whether it's uh, more like um, subcellular and, and suborganism impact, but also out to the more uh, whole organism function uh, effects, which are uh, then occurring at a later stage. Um, and uh, if you have um, changes of fitness relevant parameters, you will also see impacts in the, in the populations of different species shown here in the, in, in the lower end of the slide. If we focus on the, on the, on the dolphins, this uh, slide here is uh, kind of highlighting um, the different parameters that uh, that um, that uh, or effect parameters that have been reported by uh, by the research, and you can see that there's a lot of uh, of uh, uh, different um, uh, effects that have occurred in dolphins uh, because of the oil spill. Uh, and, uh, and this is also an illustration of how we are planning to kind of uh, provide this kind of information for the public. Because when you, when you look at a, a, a picture like that, and you can, can um, imagine that, uh, that uh, you try to get everything into one uh, illustration, um, you can also make use of it uh, as a platform for providing knowledge. Such as, for example, uh, if someone is uh, getting to a, a total overview like this, they can just click on the different um, uh, effect parameters that are shown in yellow here. And then at the next level, they will be led directly to the studies that have been showing this kind of, um, of um, impact. So that is uh, what we hope to, to do uh, in, uh, in the follow-up of this work. Uh, lastly, um, this uh, uh, slide shows the, how um, much um, or how many um, research articles have been produced on the different animal groups. Uh, and, um, and fish, uh, and this is a logarithmic um, overview uh, or scale on the, on the left, uh, as you can see. Uh, fish is clearly uh, uh, the most focused um, animal group uh, after Deepwater Horizon, 
uh, but also um, uh, dolphins and seabirds, corals, turtles, and even plankton uh, have been uh, been uh, well studied. Uh, so the numbers up here is the total number of uh, of articles that have been produced looking at the different um, animal groups. Uh, so that is uh, leading us to the last slide. So. Uh, this uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, clearly caused wide-ranging effects uh, in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but um, fortunately, uh, the, the effect predictions that were uh, in the early phase were stating that the, the, the Gulf will be dead after the Deepwater Horizon. That prediction did not come true. Actually, it, 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 um, it uh, coped quite well with the oil spill uh, in, in the large picture. Although uh, that is not to say that it was non-ecological um, impact at all. Absolutely, there were. But, uh, but uh, the worst case scenario did not materialize. Um, but still, there are certain animal groups that are uh, particularly uh, necessary to, to, um, to keep a close eye on. And that is in particular the large fishes uh, that, that kind of relied, uh, as we were kind of discussed about um, the, the cardiac effects, um, but also uh, the sea turtles, which are highly um, vulnerable, um, especially one of the species of sea turtles. And the, the bottlenose uh, dolphin population also need continued attention. Um, we have not got time to go into the details about that, but, uh, but the, the dolphin population has clearly developed a lower health quality after deepwater horizon, but they are, they are still able to, to survive, and that is good. Uh, and still, there are around 100 new papers coming um, uh, addressing the different ecological long-term impacts after deepwater horizon oil spill. But um, if you want to have details about um, all this research, you can, you can um, go into um, uh, our uh, review paper and uh, re read about it. Uh, you will be provided a, a link to that uh, here. Um, and um, I can also say that uh, we could, uh, uh, also, uh, we would like also to, to do a follow-up of this paper, uh, as long as the, there are now twice as many research papers uh, published um, than it were in 2016 when we are, were uh, publishing our review. So, um, I would just say uh, thank you to, to you all and also thank you to the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association that uh, funded this this work, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bayer. It was very interesting. The next speaker is Dr. Lisa Ritchie, and her presentation is entitled "Fundamental Social Dimensions of Marine Oil Spills." Dr. Ritchie is a professor of sociology and associate director of the Center for Coastal Studies at Virginia Tech, USA. During her 30-year career, Dr. Ritchie has studied a range of disaster events, including the Exxon Valdez and Deepwater Horizon oil spills. Since 2000, her focus has been on the social impacts of disasters, including conducting, conducting social impact assessments. From 2007 to 2018, she served as Associate Director of the Natural Hazard Centers at the University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder. Dr. Ricci has also been a National Institute of Standards and Technology Disasters Resilience Fellow, a member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine Committee for measuring the community resilience, and an advisory board member for the National Academics Gulf Research Program. So now the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just get my screen up and running here. Uh, 
All right, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I would like to say good morning or afternoon or evening to those who are elsewhere. I'm in Blacksburg, Virginia in the beautiful mountains here. Uh, thank you so much for Dr. Beyer and Dr. Fodry's presentations on the natural impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in particular. And I'm gonna turn now to talking a little bit about uh, the social impacts of marine oil spills on the social environment in various communities. Uh, I am a sociologist, so I look at the social effects of marine oil spills on communities that have been affected by them. I've studied a number of marine oil spills, the largest of which was the Exxon Valdez oil spill from back in 1989, and more recently, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I also study uh, toxic contamination events, uh, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority coal ash spill that happened here in 2008. What we know about the social impacts of marine oil spill really comes from a long-standing body of knowledge and empirical research on the societal dimensions of hazards and disasters in general. And my area of focus tends to be on human caused or anthropogenic or technological disasters. And what you're looking at here is the continuum of deliberateness for disaster events. And what that means is that on the left hand side of the screen, you're seeing what we would consider to be what the literature refers to as acts of God. And those are typically considered natural disasters, such as tornadoes, for example, or earthquakes. Then moving into the center of this spectrum uh, is technological disasters, as I just mentioned. And that's where my area of study focuses. Moving further to the right, we have impacts related to litigation and compensation processes that typically happen at least in the United States. And then we move more over to what we would refer to as purposeful or premeditated acts in terms of this continuum of deliberateness. And what we see in this continuum is not necessarily black and white in terms of the impacts or the social effects, but rather we see overlapping qualities, characteristics, and social impacts of these different kinds of disasters. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I've had the what I refer to as unfortunate opportunity to study several marine oil spills. The first that I started studying was the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And I started my work uh, with my dissertation in 2001. So more than a decade after the Exxon Valdez oil spill took place up in Prince William Sound, Alaska. What I did was look at the long-term impacts of the oil spill on a community in Cordova, Alaska, there was a population of about 2,500 people at the time. And what I wanted to do was look at the psychosocial and the sociocultural impacts of this event on the people of Cordova, which is considered ground zero for the social impacts of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. I've studied an additional several smaller spills to date. And as you can understand, the dimensions of social impacts are directly related to the size of the spill. So obviously the smaller the spill, the lesser, though not less important, dimensions of the social impacts of the spills. The work that I do is both qualitative and quantitatively oriented. So we do survey research, to gather quantitative data in communities that have been affected by oil spills, as well as adjacent communities for control groups. And we also do qualitative research, 
which means that we go into communities and do observations. We interview key stakeholders and community residents to get a better understanding of how the oil spill events are affecting the populations there, particularly looking at groups that might have been more affected than others. Despite the different scales of these disasters, such as the largest Deepwater Horizon and the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill in the United States, these smaller spills also show a number of similar characteristics in terms of the kinds of social impacts that they have. So just as we were wrapping up our study of the long-term impacts of the Exxon Valdez oil spill into the late 2009s or so into 2010, I was actually up in Cordova, Alaska, closing down a study on looking at the compensation processes and how they affected the community of Cordova and the residents there. That's when the Deepwater Horizon started in April. And we were there in the summer up in Alaska and people asked us whether we were going to be studying the Deepwater Horizon spill. And we were fortunate enough to see some National Science Foundation funding to do that work as we began that in the, the fall around September of 2010. So as the other doctors have shared with us this morning, the Deepwater Horizon is one of the most studied spills, not only with respect to the marine environment, but to the social environment as well. In fact, there are still ongoing studies of the psychosocial and sociocultural effects of this spill uh, on the, the communities along the Gulf Coast uh, in uh, Northern Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> so there are a number of key issues associated with marine oil spills that we've documented over the years. First of all, we see pervasive uncertainty and psychosocial stress that affects communities at various levels. So the uncertainty is associated with the kinds of questions that were raised in previous presentations here this morning, looking at the perceptions of food safety, contamination, the recovery of species and so forth. This includes contested interpretations of the event. You know, how, how bad is it? What is the extent of it? What species is it affecting? Is it safe to breathe the air when you're working on the cleanup? Is it safe to drink the water in the areas uh, where the spill occurred and compensation? hasn't yet determined whether there are any long-term impacts on the physical infrastructure. People feel a loss of control over their natural environment and don't feel safe necessarily in their communities given the uncertain nature of the toxic contamination. With marine oil spills, there are primary responsible parties that are blamed and held responsible for these events. So in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, uh, BP Corporation was held responsible along with a number of other parties, including Halliburton. And of course the Exxon company was responsible in large part for the Exxon Valdez oil spill. We also have response processes such as cleanup activities and controversial cleanup activities such as the use of dispersants that were previously talked about and people uh, have contested beliefs about what is okay to use and what is not okay to use. And so we have communities dealing with those response processes. The more a community is tied to the environment for its livelihood and its cultural practices, the more a community is affected by toxic contamination as a result of marine oil spills. So what we're looking at is social vulnerability to environmental hazards. And among the things that we look about when we talk about social vulnerability to toxic oil spills 
are things like the amount of exposure. So whether one uh, actually worked on the cleanup, for example. Uh, we look at age and we look at gender. We look at ethnic minority status and we particularly look at groups that are more likely to have negative impacts uh, from the oil spill contamination, such as commercial fishermen, those involved with the tourism industry and, and others in that regard. We also see disruption uh, of interpersonal and group relationships, which we call a corrosive community. And that results from contested interpretations, again, of the event, as well as competition for working on cleanup activities where people can make money. Uh, this was mentioned earlier in terms of having boom and bust cycles. We call that a money spill that might enter a community. And we also see what we refer to as invisible trauma to both the natural and social environments. So although we've just heard about some scientific studies with respect to impacts on different species in the marine environment, some of those are not visible to the naked eye. And so community members and populations might not understand the kinds of scientific data that are being collected. We also have this trauma to the social environments. And again, that has to do with community relationships with the environment and the extent to which the environment is damaged or perceived to have been damaged. We also see secondary trauma from what we refer to as compensation processes. So that might be claims or settlement activities or actual litigation in order to receive funds to help to offset the damages associated with not being able to perhaps harvest in normal ways in terms of commercial fishing or doing tourism activities such as going out on charter boats and that sort of thing. Even restaurants and communities where there are uh, influx of cleanup workers, for example, might uh, have different patterns of economic intake depending on what kinds of communities they're in, whether the communities were heavily damaged and maybe people aren't comfortable eating the seafood. We have lack of closure. There's chronic community impacts and reminders that prolong stress associated with the oil spill itself. And we can have long-term adverse health outcomes among human populations, just as we have some long-term adverse health outcomes in the marine environment. And it's important to remember that, again, what we see affects different groups in different ways. So there might be some groups and communities that recover and are less stressed over the longer term than groups that were more directly and adversely affected. So recovery becomes very elusive. Just a few findings in terms of comparing our work on the Exxon Valdez to that of our work and others in the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, what we've seen is very similar negative psychosocial and sociocultural impacts among samples in Alaska in Prince William Sound and samples in Alabama where we did our work, but also in Louisiana and Mississippi and Florida as well. What we found among the strongest predictors of health to be are, first of all, concerns about health among family members, individuals themselves, and community members, economic loss concerns in the immediate term, for example, with the moratorium on drilling, people's homes and households and livelihoods were affected by that in the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. Concerns about long-term economic impacts as a result of whether or not they'll be able to harvest and continue to go about their livelihoods. 
Connections again to renewable natural resources uh, are among the strongest predictors of stress and exposure to the oil. Again, how close you are, particularly if you're involved in cleanup activities uh, or live in some locations that are very close to where oil hit the shore or came close to hitting the shore. The other thing that we found is that involvement with compensation processes is now one of the stronger predictors of stress after a certain amount of time. So what we're talking about here is whether you are involved in settlement or litigation in particular, community members, whether or not they in involved in compensation processes, seem to have elevated levels of stress and they engage in avoidance behaviors associated with the spill. So what we're finding is that compensation involvement can be just as stressful, if not more so than the immediate aftermath of the oil spill event itself. And we're still doing a lot more work looking into those long-term processes, because if we think about it, the Exxon Valdez oil spill settlement uh, and the litigation that went all the way up to the U.S. Federal Supreme Court took more than two decades to settle. This diagram uh, is very similar to the one that I believe Dr. Byer showed, but focuses on human conditions and potential impacts of marine oil spills on communities and individuals. And you'll have access to this slide, but what we see here is the initial oil spill itself, followed by psychological effects, potential physical health effects, economic impacts, sociological effects at the community level, and then cultural effects also at the community level. So, in closing, there are a few things that we can think about in terms of moving forward. Communities need to focus on preparedness and awareness, particularly if they are in areas where there is a lot of oil and gas industry development and activities. We need to emphasize the inclusion of local knowledge, not just outside experts coming into communities. And we also need to actively seek engagement among the local population to develop effective, inclusive community responses and prevention activities and mitigation activities. We need to have a better understanding about how these kinds of processes and mitigation efforts influence community resilience and long-term recovery prospects in communities that have been affected by oil spills. And we also need to evaluate the effectiveness of programs and activities that are implemented in the aftermath of oil spills to determine whether or not they are helping in the longer term recovery of the groups that are most profoundly affected and others in the community alongside them. And I will close now. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to our panel discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Ritchie. It added a lot of important information to the following discussion. So now the chair, Talita Cruz Lopes Tavares Normando, will be conducting the participants' questions to the speakers. Thank you, Luisa. Good morning. Uh, at first, I would like to thank you and congratulate the speakers for their brilliant, brilliant presentations. And uh, today, on our second day of the Austro Spring School, we have uh, the oil contamination as the main theme. And of course, the social ecological aspects of it, as uh, our speakers presented today, are very important to discuss. So now I will follow to the questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is from uh, Professor Denis Abessa. And he asks Professor Joel Fordrill about, uh, um, uh, did the efforts to assess the impacts of deep water horizon involved 
ecological studies or were they based on ecological studies? If so, what is your, your opinion on including ecological studies into response action, action protocols? Yeah, um, so there, there have been a number of ecotoxicology studies um, and um, they're sort of a requirement of, of investigating something like an oil spill. Obviously we can't um, control all the conditions in the field we would like. So the ability to bring um, oil of different age, different weathering, different composition with and without dispersants, which was mentioned. Um, um, they are sort of a, a key building block. Um, if I'm understanding the correct question correctly. So they, to me, they're like a foundational piece. Um, how you return that to the field is the more interesting thing in this case. Um, and what I would say is I think that the fish in some ways are maybe a bad example because they seem to be doing this weird thing where they show resilience. Like if if you had done this with some of the spiders in the marsh or some of the snails or those deep water corals, um, it seems like there's a lot more alignment in the way that different things are responding. So I, um, you know, I tend to be a, a field ecologist doing surveys in the field, um, but I don't want to suggest that, that you just skip the, and you probably weren't thinking I was, but I just want to reiterate that I'm not saying skip that step of doing the good lab-based stuff. Uh, where you look at uh, the specifics of different oil compositions or weathering. And, and the good thing about these studies, and again, it's not what I do, but I'm impressed by how comprehensive they are and that it is sort of physiological, genetic, reproductive, mortality. Um, we just actually published another paper where we looked at uh, how a lot of different contaminants, so not just oil, but we looked at microplastics, we looked at ocean acidification, we looked at heavy metals, we looked at um, endocrine disruptors. And it seems like across the board, one thing they do is they appear to sort of decouple predator-prey interactions. And so that's, that's good for the prey, it's bad for the predator. Um, the, e the ecotoxicology studies probably can't get at that till you layer in this extra type of study where you're doing the more community-based stuff. Um, but what it does suggest is it does suggest that that um, energy flow around food webs may be different. And again, that's more of all of these stressors. There's all sorts of pollution, whether it's nutrient pollution or oil pollution or endocrine disruptors of different types. Um, there's a whole suite of uh, things we're doing. Um, there, there's no shortage of need uh, to wrap that up. Thank you, Professor Joel. Uh, that's it's very interesting because uh, the oil contamination uh, starts as a pulse, but the effects don't uh, stay, don't span as a pulse. So, uh, as I said, other levels of uh, studies like uh, ecotoxicological are very important to to approach this issue. Uh, the second question comes from Osvaldo Gomes, and it's for Professor John Bayer. And Osvaldo asked, just a second. Here, uh, do oil or petroleum microparticles impact several biomes affecting coral and fish that are consumed in a aquatic trough chain at different levels of the water column or even by human, humans? Mm. Can you repeat the question? I won't, won't again. Well, okay, that's fine. Uh, Osvaldo is asking if the microparticles uh, you showed in your presentation that uh, disperse from the, from the main spill those microparticles, if they impact other biomes, uh, such as corals and fish that are consumed, or even in the trophic chains, for example, getting to the humans? Uh, yeah. Well, did you mean that um, the, 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 the particles, uh, the oil particles, you mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, 
the the particles uh, whether you mean oil uh, in in a in a blowout it's uh, it's the when the when the oil comes out in 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 the water it is in micro particles or very very small uh, but they are they tend to 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 group together so they get uh, bigger and uh, and that is uh, the the first the process of fate that is relevant to what the, how the oil will behave uh, in the further uh, fate process uh, if you keep the the particles small they will tend to to stay underwater uh, if uh, and 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 the main way of doing that is to add dispersions. Um, if the oil is behaving without dispersions, they, they will group together and form bigger particles or bigger droplets. Uh, and they will then uh, have a, a higher uh, buoyancy uh, and um, rise upwards uh, to the sea surface. So that means that, that, that um, uh, surface living organisms will be exposed to the surfaced oil. Uh, but then also it's a question uh, whether the response team uh, is using um, dispersants in the surface, because then you can re-enter the oil down into the water column. So, uh, so uh, the response is, uh, is actually controlling where the oil will, uh, will go by whether they are using dispersants or not. So it's uh, it is important to to uh, to have a good plan of how to what kind of uh, of um, ecosystems uh, compartments are the most sensitive ones in an area, and then trying to avoid that oil is going into the most sensitive part. Uh, generally, also it is important to to, to remember that um, as long as you uh, that as long as the oil is uh, staying uh, offshore. Uh, the, the tendency of large impacts are reduced. So shoring of oil will always increase the environmental impact. So typically uh, our response team will try to uh, avoid oil from reaching shore. That is uh, done both by, by collecting the oil as, uh, as much as possible by various uh, measures. Uh, but also by by using um, dispersants to to mix the oil down into the water. And so uh, the question of of uh, if, if an area, for example, have um, a large um, uh, seafood industry, uh, they will be concerned if you are uh, using dispersants because then you are mixing oil down into the water column where the the seafood. Uh, the population of fish lives. So that is also an important uh, part of the question. And, and of course, also it's uh, associated with um, concern from the public because um, they, as consumers of uh, seafood, they don't want to be eating contaminated food, uh, obviously. So, uh, so this is um, also um, uh, one question in the in, uh, the, how the society uh, has to be protected uh, against the impact of an oil spill. So, yeah, I don't know whether that was a answer of the question, but uh, but uh, as long as um, oil is kind of staying away from seafood areas, that is uh, important for the public. Thank you, Professor John Bayer. Um... And yeah, I, I think you, you answered the, the question, thank you. And uh, the other question goes from Dr. Lisa Ritchie. And uh, Luis Fernandes answered as Chris, if did uh, the notes, did you notice any change in the interviewer's repression, uh, repression or sense of loss after the so-called recovery in, in the two minutes? Uh, of the conditions? I think one of the profound statements that I heard from several interviewees up in Alaska was that the oil spill would never be complete for them until they died. That it was such an impactful 
negative experience on their lives and that of the community members that there was not really a way to fully recover. But with that said, the data that we've collected over the years, over about a 20 year period, does suggest that the stress levels in Cordova have diminished since the closure of the Supreme Court decision back in the late 2000s. And so there is promise there. Uh, there's also promise with the next generation of commercial fishermen that are coming back and maintaining the traditions of commercial fishing. One of the challenges in Cordoba in particular is that the herring population has not recovered in Prince William Sound. And there are debates, as I believe Dr. Faudry indicated, about the causes of that crash of the herring population. But most people that we spoke with indicated that they strongly believed, based on the science that was going on with the Prince William Sound Science Center, that the oil from the Exxon Valdez was the primary cause of that crash. Then looking at the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we are seeing some strong community resilience along the Gulf Coast. The tourism industry seems to have rebounded quite nicely. We do still see elevated levels of stress and depression among some of those harvesting groups that may have relied on subsistence harvests for their livelihoods and their cultural way of life. And there's still a lack of trust in some of the safety and the recovery data associated with certain uh, species and, and populations in different pockets around the Gulf. But at this point, those are, are minimal. So I would say, Although it's taken a long time, you know, we're looking at being almost 12, 13 years after uh, we are finally starting to see some abatement of the stress and depression among those populations. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Lisa. Um, the next question goes for both Prof. Uh, Dr. Faudry and Dr. Bayer. And uh, uh, the person asks if uh, how long can one relate a direct effect of an oil spill to uh, the area where it occurred? And also, how uh, many months or years are necessary to monitor the concentrations of uh, persistent uh, hydrocarbons or even other contaminants to the concentrations we had before the accident, for example. So to, to specific to Deepwater Horizon, some of my understanding is um, th this was a messy spill in a couple of different ways in that certainly the Northern Gulf has had some inoculation of oiling uh, before. There's a little bit of natural seepage and there's been oil spills happening for a while. Um, there is one uh, pipe out there that's releasing oil for the last 20 years, and it just is a slow creep. Um, some of the people at LSU who were chiefly responsible for being involved in what were called the SCAT surveys early on, I think the name has changed, but it was sort of the shoreline mapping. Um, the labs that went out there and, and sampled for oil would tell you, well, there's, there's oil everywhere. Um, and... Another thing that made this spill difficult, and I don't, this, I wish I could be more general, which I'll finish on a general comment um, for the other panelists to maybe in, inform us, but like uh, we had sites that were oiled early on and sites that weren't oiled early on. And then it almost, it almost flipped because of storms and hurricanes. And there were a number of storms that passed through in the years after, and it would redistribute the oil that was out there in ways that made life fairly difficult to, to have clear unimpacted sites and impacted sites. So uh, to wrap that up, what I would say is maybe the Gulf is a little bit of an um, end member in terms of 
the distribution of oil before, during, and after, the Valdez may have been a much more clear, um, Dr. Ritchie can maybe comment, you know, there's oil here and there's oil, not the oil there. The Gulf was a was a challenging one as I understood it. And maybe Dr. Byer or Ritchie has other, other comments. Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit that the, that the, the kind of oil that the Deepwater Horizon released uh, was not the worst kind of oil. It was a, a medium light type um, and, and that was uh, good uh, because uh, more heavy oils, uh, such as the, the type of oil that, uh, that is um, typical for, uh, for Venezuela, for example, would be much more uh, serious um, uh, as it is uh, um, a much more heavy crude oil. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, that the Deepwater Horizon type uh, is uh, is um, okay because it's also about the total amount, uh, which was huge uh, in in uh, in the Deepwater Horizon. Um, much of the research that have been done after the the oil spill have been focusing on on uh, the marine bacteria, uh, and there has been. Because, because the the natural occurring bacteria is an important factor in the in the ecological recovery process after at, at, uh, all kinds of oil spills, uh, and it has been a question whether the, the northern Gulf of Mexico, uh, because you there have a lot of natural seeps as well, uh, whether they are um, more capable of uh, of kind of boosting. Uh, the bacterial species that are degrading oil. Uh, and um, the question to that is, uh, well, um, that uh, it seemed to be that the, uh, above um, continental shelves, you, you have a natural presence of oil degrading bacteria that, that will bloom uh, whenever the, the, the there are coming oil into the system. So, uh, but the, but the, much research has been done uh, on uh, after the Horizon on the bacterial uh, communities uh, in the in the marine areas, and uh, and obviously that is also important for how long will the oil stay in the system. The more degrading you see, uh, the quicker the the degradation of the oil spill also will be. So so that is an important question, uh, and it's also something that could po possibly be utilized uh, in, in uh, our response process uh, if you are able to, for example, to increase um, the, or improve the conditions, the blooming conditions for those bacteria that, that, um, that uh, are um, uh, good for degrading the oil by, add, for example, by adding um, those uh, elements that are uh, limiting the, the growth. That is one of the, the type of uh, research uh, fields that, uh, that uh, have been focused uh, also in Norway after Deepwater Horizon. You know, I'd like to point out that this very conversation that we're having and the nature of the questions that we're hearing demonstrate that even the scientists aren't sure necessarily about the impacts on different species and, and locations and the recovery process and when the oil is gone, how it degradates. And we're you know trained to do this. And you as students out there are being trained to work in these environments. And so just put yourselves in the shoes of community members who are not experts in science and do not have the training that we have and that you as students are going to have. And there's a lot of conflicting information and it's hard to know what to believe and, and how to understand and interpret that. And it's not to say that community members aren't educated in their own local traditions and understandings and the way they go about harvesting but just keeping in mind that this scientific communication is one of the greatest challenges that we face when we're dealing with oil spills in particular. Mm -hmm. I also would like to add that, uh, that uh, it is typically that um, after a spill situation, um, 
you tend to have focus on the visible damages. Uh, and from an ecological point of view, uh, it can also be important to remember the, those parts of the ecosystem that we don't observe so, uh, so easily. Uh, and, and especially the deep water um, uh, area uh, can have um, uh, long living species like uh, deep water corals. Uh, and uh, and we know that uh, some of these uh, coral species they can they can live for for hundreds and and maybe even thousands of years. So these kind of organisms are are highly adapted to a very special ecosystem down there. Uh, and uh, but it's a problem that it's extremely dif difficult to observe uh, what's what's happening after. They they uh, are uh, being exposed to this kind of uh, of um, oil spill disaster, um, and that is a good thing about the about the research done after the deepwater horizon. This has been uh, also a focus on on the deepwater ecosystem, and that is really important because um, that that system can be much more vulnerable than many of the other species that that are more easily observed at the surface. So keep in mind that. Thank you. Uh, due to time constraints, we only have time for two more questions. One, more, one of them is for uh, Dr. Lizzie Ritchie. Uh, Kelvin asks, how can one translate the scientific findings back to popular information. So one of the things that we take great care in doing is going back to the communities where we have conducted our work and give presentations in ways that local populations can understand and we can have a communication dialogue so that we're not just standing in front of a room and presenting, but that we take questions and answers. We also tend to work directly with communities as we are developing our studies. So as we're developing our survey instruments, we ask for feedback about whether the questions make sense or not, whether they are understandable and applicable, as well as when we're doing our narrative interviews and giving them time to share information with us. Uh, when we do writing for lay populations, as in people who are not involved in social science, we work very hard to use terminology that is understandable, that is relatable and brings local populations voices to them so that they are in a position to engage in community prevention activities and longer term recovery activities as well. So those are a couple of approaches. And in particular, even when we're publishing in peer reviewed journals, we try to take that information and make it more accessible to general audiences. And we also work with reporters who have ways of translating the scientific information into more accessible ways for general populations. And so those are some of the approaches that we take to distributing and disseminating our findings. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Uh, and the last question, I think it goes for, for all speakers. And uh, a person wants to know a little bit more about any mechanisms that can that could put in place to guarantee or even protect the research that has been is being done uh, from any conflict of interest, and also what precautions are taken to reduce some uh, bias on this issue. Well, I can just go quickly first. Uh, the work that my colleagues and I have done over the years has primarily been sponsored by the National Science Foundation. So we are not involved with oil and gas or industry 
resources to conduct our work. We've had those opportunities over time and chosen not to take them because of the appearance of objectivity or introducing that kind of bias. I'm not suggesting that uh, taking industry money automatically puts you in that position, but for us, the appearance uh, of that was something that we conscientiously decided to avoid. And we have also been involved in court cases where we've been asked for expert witness testimony, and we have been in a position to provide that in light of the fact that, uh, again, our funding comes from the National Science Foundation, and we were comfortable presenting it based on, on that. I will also say that uh, th that is a really good question uh, and it's important one as well, because um, uh, typically after uh, um, a pollution event, uh, you expect that the, that the, the responsible industry is, uh, is also funding the aftermath studies. Uh, and it's an important principle that uh, researchers should be um, uh, not biased, and, uh, and but uh, uh, and it's automatically a um, problem that uh, that um, if researchers are getting money from the problem owner uh, or the responsible for a pollution event, or, um, it will automatically lead to suspicion of uh, of uh, non-objectivity. Uh, and that is a that is a, a, a chronic pro problem because uh, researchers we are we need to have um, confidence from our users that uh, what we are getting to of conclusions are not because we are funded by the problem owner but because uh, uh, what we see in the field. But uh, and I think also that this is um, illustrating the value of publishing the information because the best way we have to to get out with good information is that you have uh, peer uh, colleagues that are quality assuring uh, what you are uh, reporting so if you are ending up um, with the data in a uh, on a non peer reviewed report uh, typically, uh, that kind of uh, publication is not that trusted. But if you are publishing your work in, in a good journal, uh, there, there will be a um, quality assurance process that are kind of um, arresting you uh, if, uh, if your research uh, is not good. So, so um, measures to reduce bias, um, it's very much uh, trying to get the uh, uh, information published in a good journal uh, in a way that also non-expert can uh, understand. So having um, speaking to everybody is, uh, is important here. Um, yeah, but um, this is also something that is, I think uh, it's a chronic problem, but it's important that we have uh, also um, a respect that it's not necessarily so that if researchers are uh, pu uh, funded by by the industry that they are producing biased results, but uh, of course the, the, we need to have a quality assurance system, uh, and that is uh, the peer review process. You know what I would add quickly is that in my case, um, at some point after the spill, I became part of one of these consortiums funded through the Gomri uh, Gulf of Me Mexico Research In uh, Initiative or In Institute which was set up by a BP damage fund, um, felt really disconnected from obviously BP in that context. Um, uh, the, the point I would add here is that uh, my ability to be involved in the oil spill research really happened because I was collecting data before the oil spill. And there was no agency from BP or another oil company providing that money, right? So the ability to fund long-term observational studies is a real challenge for all of us. And when these companies do bad or have an accident that they have to pay for, that only comes into play after the event. And if you're not out there ahead of time getting the before data, it can really 
uh, limit our ability to, to, to gain strong inference. So to me, the real challenge is how to, how to support appropriate observational long-term, reasonably high resolution survey programs so that you're not doing emergency room science um, only in the aftermath of one of these catastrophes. And a, a mechanism for that, um, it, it requires choices. We can't observe everything all the time. There's simply too much. I appreciate that. But we often are, are left kind of scratching our heads about, well, if we had more data before the event or before the damage, we'd have more power. And how do you support that is a real challenge. So oh, thank you again, Dr. Joe Faudry, Dr. John Bayer, and Dr. Lisa Ricci for your presentation and also for the discussion. Unfortunately, we have to, to, to close this first section. Uh, the other, uh, and I will pass to Luisa to end the session. Again, thank you. Thank you all. It was a very interesting discussion in which added a lot of knowledge to everyone in here. Now we will have a short break and at half past one UTC time, the session two will begin. So see you in a minute.
Hello, everybody. We are back, and the session two has a theme how to research oil pollution, water, sediment, and biotic components. The chair of the session is MSC Gabriele Melos Fernandes from the Labomar, and the speakers are Dr. Jagos Hadovic, Dr. Christopher Reddy, and Paul Phil. In the second session, there will be all three speakers' presentations and then a 20-minute discussion where the questions from the audience will be answered by the speakers. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Jagos Hadovic with the presentation entitled Chemical Assessments of Marine, My, Marine Oil Spills, Concepts, Tools, and Case Studies. He's a researcher at the Department of Geoscience, University of Calgary in Canada. He holds a PhD degree in environmental analytical chemistry from the University of Barcelona and currently. For more than 10 years, Dr. Radovic has, has been researching marine oil spills in coastal, open ocean and deep sea settings, including work on some of the largest oil spills cases, such as the Prestige Tanker Accident and the Deepwater Horizon and the Xtox One blowouts. He, he participated in major national and international consortia that developed risk assessment methodologies for oil and chemical spills in European seas. He studied the impact of oil spills on the ecosystems of Gulf of Mexico and informed policy and strategies for oil spill preparedness and response in the Arctic. As a member of the Bonn Agreement Oil Spill Identification Network of experts, Dr. Redovic contributed to the improvement of standardized oil, oil spill fingerprinting protocol. So thank you, and the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay, I assume you see the right right screen, no? Yes, you can see it. Okay. So first of all, thanks for the uh, kind invitation to present some of my work that I've been uh, working on in the past few years that basically centers around using various tools and methods of analytical chemistry to improve uh, chemical assessments of oil spills in marine settings. Also, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the <clears throat> colleagues that have been involved in, in this work, both in Europe and North America, as well as their uh, funding agencies. So I'll start my talk by uh, introducing the, the issue of oil inputs to marine environments. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to understand that oil can come into, into the sea through natural sources, through natural seeps, which are localized geological phenomena where oil basically seeps through the seafloor into the water column. And these are globally distributed occurrences that amount to a substantial amount of oil that uh, is released every year into the, into the sea. On the other side, we have anthropogenic sources, which uh, I would divide into smaller scale spills, so-called operational spills that occur during routine operations uh, in shipping and other uh, marine operations. These are small volume spills, typically uh, easy to contain and clean up. And finally, we have uh, large accidental spills, which will be the focus of, of my talk, where we have a major release uh, of large amounts of oil in a relatively short time frame. So the damages caused by these spills are quite substantial, both to the ecosystems, economy, and uh, coastal communities. Here I'm showing the 19 uh, photo from 1989, Exxon Valdez tanker spill that was uh, mentioned previously, uh, which caused major damages in, in the in the in the Alaska where it happened, and also was I would say a turning point for both oil spill science as well as uh, oil spill regulations. Since that period, seventies and eighties, the uh, oil spill risk has been evolving. 
In particular, there's a trend of decreasing um, number and volume of uh, tanker spills, despite the increased uh, volume of oil that, that is being transported in the global ocean that's uh, due to better marine safety and improved tanker design. On the other hand, we, we saw some new risks emerging in past decades. Uh, I would highlight the move of uh, oil and gas industry to, to deep waters, to deep and ultra deep drilling. And obviously, uh, you probably heard of 2010 Deepwater Horizon blowout, which was a blowout on a, on a deep, uh, deep water drilling rig. Also, with climate change and global warming, some of the uh, shipping routes that were previously inaccessible are opening, such as the Arctic, and the traffic, marine traffic in those areas is increasing, which obviously uh, raises the risk of smaller and larger spills. Here I'm showing an example of a uh, tourist cruiser that's, uh, that's passing through Canadian Arctic. And finally, uh, in past uh, decades, some new Fuel types came to the market, such as diluted bitumen from heavy oil resources the, like the ones we have in Canada, or some new types of shipping fuels. Again, new types of materials that uh, whose risk profile we we have to better understand. So, what do I mean when I say chemical assessments of oil spills? Basically, uh, we're looking at several questions main questions i would say we want to understand where the oil is coming from what is the source possibly decouple various sources of oils uh, we look at fate how the oil is transformed through uh, biotic or abiotic processes and ultimately we want to understand what are the impacts and negative effects of oil spill to do that we have to understand both the pre-spill factors that come into play which are basically the geological history of oil formation in the reservoir. Uh, in the case of petroleum products, we have to understand uh, all the processes that happen in the refinery. And then once the material is released to, to the sea, uh, we look at various types of uh, transformation processes that we collectively call weathering. And finally, we look for possible uh, mixing with uh, other natural or anthropogenic uh, organic matter. So let's dive a bit into these two these two areas. So first of all, the the material that is being spilled, the uh, crude oil or petroleum product. Uh, Oils are one of the most complex complex chemical mixtures uh, that we know of on par with natural organic matter. Uh, typically, uh, researchers, researchers focus on hydrocarbons, which are molecules that only contain carbon and hydrogen. And these are, uh, in most of, uh, most of the oils, these are predominantly uh, most abundant compounds that we find. But then we also have a whole plethora of um, less well-characterized compounds that contain heteroatoms nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, predominantly some of them metals. They can be, they can have increased molecular weights such as the compounds we find in, in the resin and asphalt infraction. And the important thing to point out is that in uh, specific types of oil such as heavy degraded crudes, uh, heavy residual products of oil refining, as well as in heavily weathered residues, these types of compounds would actually be enriched compared to conventional hydrocarbons. Once the oil comes to the marine environment, uh, it immediately starts to be transformed and starts to interact with, <clears throat> with the environment. Uh, these are complex biogeochemical processes. Uh, it is important to uh, appreciate the time scale they occur on, anything from hours to months, years, or even decades. Uh, these processes involve all the uh, compartments, water column, <clears throat> deep sediment, shorelines, as well as obviously the living organisms and trophic chains in, in, the, in the marine environment. Also, it's important to know that these changes that we call weathering change the molecular composition of the spilled material, and that in turn also influences these uh, processes and ultimate partitioning and fate of the oil. 
So in order to better understand these <clears throat> complex, uh, complex processes and the complex material that is, uh, that is oil, uh, we need to apply from the analytical chemistry perspective, we need to apply a suite of complementary tools and methods. Historically, the, the main tool to study oil spills was conventional gas chromatography, which is still quite useful tool. However, it is limited only on a, uh, it looks only at a limited suite of volatile hydrocarbons, alkanes, aromatics, some biomarkers, while the uh, bulk of the rest of the oil remains poor, quite poorly characterized. So in recent uh, years, some uh, advances in instrumental techniques and analytical methods uh, expanded our analytical window. Uh, I would highlight the advent of two-dimensional gas chromatography, which vastly increased the uh, resolution power for a volatile portion of, uh, of the oil. And for the uh, non-volatile polar and high molecular weight species, that I mentioned, uh, I would highlight the advent of uh, high resolution mass spectrometry, ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry specifically, and also some other more conventional tools such as liquid chromatography, spectroscopy, NMR, and others that allow us to, to probe uh, what was before uh, somewhat of a, of a dark dark matter in, 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 in petroleum composition. So we can look at these high molecular weight species that are not GC amenable. So I'll try to illustrate uh, uh, some of some of these uh, these novel approaches and novel methods uh, by looking at a couple of <clears throat> spill cases that I worked on. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll talk about the Ixtoc spill. Uh, this was a spill uh, that happened in 1979, uh, somewhat of an analog of the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, again, it was it was a an exploratory oil rig, albeit in uh, way shallower water some 60 meters depth, but similar type of damage and impacts that were, uh, that, were, that were caused by this spill in the southern portion of the Gulf of Mexico. So I was, I was privileged to be part of a, of a research consortium and that in 2016 uh, went to, to the southern Gulf and collected many samples both on the coast and in the open sea, as well as uh, sediments. Uh, along the surface expression of the Ixtoc spill and at the sites of known oiling by this historic spill. Uh, so we, we used some of these uh, novel uh, analytical chemistry approaches to probe some of those samples and see if there's uh, any uh, residues of this uh, historic spill that can be detected more than 35 years after the spill. And that indeed was the case. Here I'm showing a, an example of a deep water core taken from, <clears throat> from more than 1,000 meter, meters depth. Uh, in that core, in, in one of the stratigraphic uh, uh, layers, we found uh, uh, oil. Uh, the oil was extracted and uh, based on stratigraphy of the core that corresponds to the period when the, when the spill happened. Uh, then we applied uh, both conventional fingerprinting techniques using GCMS. We looked at some specific uh, biomarker ratios, as well as uh, we use also the high resolution mass spectrometry. And uh, based on the, the results and comparison, both with the literature data and also with the, with the source stock oil that we had, in ha that we had at hand, we concluded that uh, we're likely, very likely looking at the residue of this uh, historic spill that through uh, deposition processes ended up in the deep water, deep water sediments. Uh, I would again highlight here the importance of the high resolution mass spec. Basically, it allowed us to probe these um, sulfur species, high molecular weight sulfur species that otherwise wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be detectable using some of the conventional techniques. Uh, switching to uh, another type of question that I mentioned, research question that I mentioned, uh, when we think of how the oil is transformed, 
Uh, I will illustrate that by using examples from two spills uh, that happened a bit more recently. One is the prestige spill. This was a tanker spill of heavy fuel oil product uh, that occurred in northwest of Spain and affected Spanish coast and even some of the French, uh, northern French coast. Uh, the oiling of the coastline was very extensive, caused major damages. And on the other hand, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the coastal residues that we collected and analyzed in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon. And those were found both as the uh, these, these uh, rock deposits uh, that were collected on the beaches, as well as these uh, oil sand agglomerates that we call sand paddies. So what are the, oops, sorry about that. So what were the, what were the main observations from, uh, from looking at these, these residues? Uh, first of all, they were heavily weathered. So again, a gas chromatography was, was, uh, was not really useful because most of the vol volatile fraction was gone and was converted into what is called unresolved complex mixture. We confirmed those trends by using uh, thin layer chromatography, uh, a very conventional tool, but it was very useful to demonstrate that saturated and aromatic fractions were actually transformed into more, more polar species. Some other tools such as uh, spectroscopy showed us that uh, there was uh, oxygen incorporation associated with those processes. And then uh, by combining field results with some photo irradiation experiments that we did in the lab, we concluded that most of this transformation was due to light-driven processes. We were also able to uh, distinguish some interesting trends, such as uh, different photosusceptibility of various types of aromatic compounds. For example, we observed that higher alkylated species are more photosusceptible. Uh, there was an influence of heteroatom presence on photosusceptibility, as well as uh, the degree of condensation was influencing how a molecule is reacting to, to light. Also, specific classes of biomarkers were, uh, were detected that were sensitive to, uh, to the light, such as triaromatic uh, steroids. And on the contrary, some others, such as homohopanes, were more susceptible to biodegradation. So by combining these various specific molecular ratios, we were actually able to decouple and quantify uh, photodegradation from biodegradation. So we were able to separate basically biotic versus abiotic uh, spill fates. Again, high resolution mass spec was, was really, uh, were really the key to corroborate this, uh, this finding. And basically, it allowed us to, to observe the formation, neoformation of these highly oxidized species from the parent hydrocarbon compounds. Here I'm showing an excerpt of uh, high resolution mass spec uh, data where we see many neoformed peaks containing oxygens that were fro formed from the, from the parent uh, Macondo well oil. Finally, I'll end up with uh, demonstrating how, again, chemical assessment can help us assess some of the negative effects of oil spills. Uh, specifically, I was uh, in, in, in part of my studies, I was looking specifically at long-term chronic uh, physiological effects, subletal effects uh, that can be expressed as mutagenicity, teratogenicity, or endocrine disruption. In order to do that, I used an approach that's called effect-directed uh, analysis. Uh, looks uh, looks busy, but in a nutshell, what the approach what the what this approach does, it takes a complex mixture such as oil. We apply some of uh, some of uh, chemical separation methods uh, to make uh, fractions that have simpler composition than the starting material. And then we use these uh, uh, simplified uh, fractions to run a, a pseudo of both ecotoxicological assays, in vitro assays that look at some of these toxic endpoints and toxic pathways. And on the other hand, we analyze the same fraction using uh, uh, chemical characterization methods. In this case, we use two-dimensional gas chromatography coupled to, to mass spec. 
And once we have these two data sets, uh, the, the toxicity data set on one hand and chemical molecular composition on the other, we modeled and combined these two data sets to, to gain better insight which compounds are the, the most uh, responsible for the observed effects. And in this way, in this uh, Nazi crude and heavy fuel oil, we were able to identify certain types of alkyl substituted aromatic species that were uh, the highest contributors, contributors to observed uh, uh, mutagenic and uh, endocrine disruption effects. So it's a very useful approach that can uh, help us to prioritize specific compound groups, as well as uh, to uh, classify and improve the risk assessment of different oil types. So at the end, I would just like to leave you with a couple of take home messages. I hope I had demonstrated that the oil spill risk uh, is still present. It evolved from uh, past couple of decades, but it's still, it's, it's still present in, in different ways. Uh, I would uh, like to highlight the importance of chemical approaches as a cornerstone for oil spill science that is relevant for response, damage assessment, remediation, and long-term monitoring of spill effects. Also, I would highlight the importance of using novel instrumental uh, and analytical chemistry methods and combining them with some conventional tools, which helps us to expand the scope of, uh, of chemical assessments and allows for better characterization of both complex uh, oil inputs, complex processes, and impacts. And finally, uh, I think that uh, by looking at some of the, the historic spills, we can better inform future research needs uh, and have better oil spill preparedness. Uh, it was mentioned in previous uh, discussion, the importance of biogeochemical baselines uh, is, is, is really uh, paramount, especially in these sensitive areas. We have to better understand these new fate processes, such as photo oxidation, how they influence uh, response measures and fate and impacts, as well as we, we, we need to better understand novel types of uh, crude oils and petroleum products that are being shipped uh, worldwide. With that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and looking forward to, to the discussion later on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Yagos, for the important shared information. The next speaker is Dr. Christopher Reddy with a presentation entitled A Pressing Need to Study the Immediate Fate and Effects of Oil Spills. Dr. Reddy is a senior, senior scientist uh, in the Department of Marine Chemistry and Ge Geochemistry at Woods Hole Oceanography Institution. For the past three dec decades, Dr. Reddy has researched marine pollution uh, chemical ecology and development of more environmentally friendly industrial chemicals. He has studied major oil spills such as the Deepwater Horizon, ocean dumping, and plastics. Reddy has published over 200 peer reviewed manuscripts and holds 10 US patents. Reddy, Reddy earned a BS in chemistry from Rhode Island College and PhD for in chemical oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Reddy, the screen is yours. Okay, it's, um, thank you. Let me see. It's not letting me share. Do do you want me? Do you want me to share it? And you say next slide? It's yeah, Katerina, that's fine. It's Katerina, let's try from my yeah, side. Okay? Let's do that. Okay. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak to you and inviting me. And I uh, want to thank the previous speakers and previous session and Johnny and Joel and these all those really good talks and Yagos. I highly recommend you stay on and see Paul's talk thereafter. Um, next, um, you know, before I start, um, actually, um, before I start, can you just go back one slide? Before I start, one thing you have to remember is that during an oil spill, the oil is the enemy. Okay, so we can think about the spiller, we can think about the media, we can think about a lot of things, but as scientists, the oil is the enemy. 
but it's also an opportunity for us to understand how nature works because oil is an uninvited guest. We are putting nature on a treadmill. So the interesting aspects about studying oil spills is it helps us uh, make a bad thing from getting worse. And oil spills a bad thing, but how can science make it not as harmful, but also allows us to understand how nature works. How does it win sunlight, microbes, or does it win breaking it down? So next slide. Um, this is really fun for me because I have a strong connection with Brazilian scientists. I've had several um, recent visitors in my lab. And uh, in fact, my first PhD student um, um, was a Brazilian, now she lives in the U.S. Um, so this is really special for me, and we've been working on the 2019 mystery oil spill as well. So um, this is really great for me, and I'm happy to, to be here. So next slide. I know a lot of you are students here, and I'm not, I'm not sure where you are in your career trajectory, but I just want to remind you that uh, I'm at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution up in the United States near Boston, uh, we have a PhD program that's jointly uh, shared with MIT. Uh, we have summer student fellow programs, which you can apply and spend the summer in a research lab. Uh, guest students can come anytime. They can either be undergraduates or graduate students. In fact, Iagos was a guest student in my lab years ago and continues to be a rock star. And you can be a visiting scientist if you're a professor or, or, uh, or an industry or anybody, you're welcome to come and, and shoot me an email um, if you want more information. Next slide. I want to start off with some takeaways. Um, and you heard a lot of this already, but once oil hits water or air, it begins to change its weathering immediately. Um, but for the most part, due to more often than not logistics and infrastructure, and as well as pre-existing relationships, it's difficult to collect samples early on. Um, it's just hard. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of things happen early on that could be useful in terms of the response of folks out there trying to make a bad thing from getting worse, um, but also just from a basic um, science perspective. So in my mind, one of the biggest challenges right now in oil spill science is that we are not getting enough samples collected early on. I don't think we're, uh, we are missing an opportunity to analyze them quickly and actually share those results quickly, even if the certainty is low, but getting this information out so it's actionable, so we can make a difference, so we can inform the media, maybe quell some concerns about local populations, about the unknown, and also help the responders making a bad thing from getting worse. But just like it's been said several times beforehand, uh, if you want to do these changes, you have to do your homework beforehand. And I would say that as an oil spill scientist, one of your biggest challenges is, is to know who will be working on these spills, who are the responders. And you don't have to be friends with them, but you should let them know who you are and what you can do. Um, and you can have these types of relationships without a, a conflict or a bias. So the next slide. So the problem is, is that um, due to a variety of reasons, it's field samples are not collected early on. And yet they, um, hold a tremendous amount of information in the short term and the long term. And it's not necessarily anybody's fault, it's just hard to do it, but there are opportunities that are often missed. So that's our, that's our problem. Okay, and I'm gonna make an argument about why that's a problem and then maybe put a path forward. So the next slide. So you've heard a lot about Deepwater Horizon. I spent about seven years of my life uh, working on the Deepwater Horizon. I, th I think I made about 80 trips down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so it's very much part of my life. But on the flip side, it is an anomaly of an oil spill. Most oil spills are not the Deepwater Horizon. You do not have 87 days of 60,000 gallons of oil released a minute from the bottom of the seafloor. In many cases, you have very smaller amounts of oil that are released from a cargo ship. Um, but this oil spill every day allowed scientists to um, get on site and actually collect a lot of samples. Not that many, but enough for us to refine how oil behaves and what happens to it early on in an event. Because we had an oil spill every day, um, we had time. Okay, next slide. Those thousands and thousands of research papers written on the Deepwater Horizon. 
I think this paper um, by Colin Ward and Ed, Ed Overton, actually it was published in 2020, forgive me, um, provides an understanding that before the Deepwater Horizon, this was kind of an appreciation of the time scales and the extent of action for a variety of processes, whether or not oil evaporates, it emulsifies, it breaks down by sunlight and microbes. Now, one thing that's lost in this figure is, is that um, there's a preference. Microbes only eat certain types of compounds uh, along, along a gradient. So there's also a preference about what types of compounds are changing. But the point of the matter is, is that um, this is what folks thought before Deepwater Horizon in a general sense about what happens to oil when it gets released. And then after the Deepwater Horizon, one of the biggest surprises was that um, you know, microbes did not respond for surface oil as fast as folks thought. And also that photooxidation was much faster, at least in this spill, and also was uh, acted upon many, many more compounds than what was previous thought. So the takeaway was in the early moments of the Deepwater Horizon, two processes acted on the oil that changed it dramatically, evaporation and photooxidation. We learned a lot about that because we were able to collect samples early on and actually show that things were happening. So, next slide. So I'm gonna make a case for you with a couple of slides from Deepwater Horizon and some other oil spills. This is a slide uh, that shows um, how the oil that was on the surface of the ocean was changing. So on the bottom left of this, of this graph was the amount of oxygen that was present in the oil. Very small amount, less than 1% oxygen was in this complex mixture of petroleum hydrocarbons. And then very quickly, within about five days, the oil that was sitting on the surface incorporated about 5% oxygen. And from a variety of different uh, programs and projects has shown that that was due to photooxidation. That the sunlight changed the oil on the surface. It didn't make it go away, but it changed its chemical composition. And that composition changed its personality. In fact, it's been shown that the efficacy for dispersants was less for photooxidized oil. Key takeaway is that photochemistry acted upon 50% of the oil in a non-discriminate manner from what we can see within a week. And next slide. Now I'm gonna show you a series of gas chromatographic traces of oil on the top, what oil that got released, and then what a sample looked like several days later. So in this case, the top panel is the Macondo well oil or the neat oil that got released from the bottom of the seafloor. And each one of those peaks represents a different compound and going from left to right, the more volatile compounds, are there and then farther out to the right. On the bottom panel is a surface slick that was collected on a cruise I was on uh, that we think was probably about a day or two old. And that what's encircled there is all the compounds that were lost, mainly due to evaporation. So a significant amount of change in a couple of days. Next slide. Another oil spill I worked on was relatively small. It was um, Costco Busan in 2007 in San Francisco Bay. It was a cargo vessel only released about 50, 60,000 gallons of bunker fuel, uh, created tremendous amount of negative impacts, uh, which is a reminder that oil volume does not drive all the significance of a negative impact. Now, in this case, the top panel is one of the tanks. This was the underway fuel. This was a vessel that was not an oil tanker. This is the oil that the boat was using from getting from its death to its destination. And I was able to collect some samples eight days later that showed this difference, that um, the oil changed in eight days. Now, we don't know when this change happened. Maybe it'll happen in the first couple hours. And that's my argument. We know something happened in the first eight days, but we don't know when, but certainly was significant. Now, in some cases, it's a little bit slower. The next slide is an oil spill that happened in 1996. Uh, next slide. Uh, off the coast of Rhode Island, which is near Boston in the US. This was a diesel fuel spill that I did my PhD on. And the upper panel was the diesel fuel. Now this was an oil barge that was bringing diesel fuel and home heating oil. Um, and in that case, the oil spill. And about four days later, there was changes, uh, but it wasn't as significant as the other spills. And this is a reminder that oil behaves differently in every location. Uh, and in this case, you know, four days was not bad. 
So it, it is doable to get out there even in a couple of days and you can still provide valuable information if you can collect it. Um, so next slide. So here's our challenge. Let's say we wanna go out and start doing more field work early on, but we're gonna to have to be prepared. You're gonna to have to find some means to pay for it. Um, then you're gonna to have to gain access. And sometimes that's not so easy because the response community, the folks who are out there trying to make this bad thing from getting worse may not want you out there. Maybe they don't want you in the way um, because they have their own job about making and stopping this spill and, and limiting damages. So my argument here is that if you wanna get out there, more often than not, you probably have to know who the responders are and develop some type of relationship with them. Again, you don't have to be friends with them, but they have to let you know, you have to let them know who you are and you have a much better chance of getting access. And I think, and again, reminding you that the enemy is the oil. Um, if you do collect samples and you are willing to share the results, um, you can make a huge difference and you can inform the response community about making a bad thing worse. If you let these results be publicly out and on the web, this helps the media have an understanding of what's going on. Information will quell concerns, uh, just like Liesl uh, uh, said earlier. So you have a great opportunity to make a big difference if you can provide it, collect samples, analyze them well, and provide the information immediately, even if it isn't peer reviewed. Um, again, it's ideal to published later, but um, there's a missed opportunity without sharing data early on. Uh, next slide. But of course, it's not so easy, right? You know, an oil spill isn't just some titration of oil into a beaker, a round bottom flask. Um, you have a very complex situation going on, more like in the right-hand side, and um, this complexity creates a lot of challenges and confusion. And so it's difficult. Um, to be involved early on because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, next slide. So let's go back. You know, uh, I often think of most people think about an oil spill as this three phases. There's a response. Those are the folks going out there that make this bad thing from getting worse. And then all, almost immediately, there are folks out there who are trying to assess the damages and provide some sense of forensics. And that starts often early. And then there's a sense of restoration about trying to make things better, or maybe as well as it was beforehand. Now, for the most part, most of the science that's published across oil spills in the last 50 years has been more on the assessment side. You know, what has happened thereafter? And my argument is, is that there's a lot going on early on in the response that we can make an appreciable difference. Next slide. Now, I said this oil spills were complex. They are complex because you have the response community, you have the media interested, you have the company that possibly spilled the oil, you have local federal agencies, uh, you have the public and you even have academia. And um, it's complex. And the key point is, is that each one of these groups has a different job or different what they consider success or what they want. And so you, if you want to make a difference early on, or actually any time, you have to appreciate that each one of these folks, the responders, the media, the industry, they all have a different goal. And they're not bad because of it, but you have to respect what's going on. You may not be happy with any of them, but you have to recognize that the public wants to know whether or not they can go to the beach next week. They want to know whether or not when they're going to have a job again. Right? Um, media wants a great story. Responders want to go home safely. Okay, next slide. Remember now, during a response, we have to disentangle ourselves from who the spiller is and just focus on making a bad thing from getting worse. Okay, so we've got to keep reminding ourselves. Okay, next slide. So I'm going to talk about one, I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, working on oil spills. And but I, I just got lucky recently working on and actually an oil and plastic spill that happened off the coast of Sri Lanka in, in May and June of 2021. And this was a cargo vessel, it wasn't an oil tanker that was collecting a wide range of chemicals as well as many, many containers of plastic 
nurgles, the small little plastic particles that you probably heard about uh, in yesterday's sessions. Um, next slide. This ship, unfortunately, had, was leaking nitric acid, and at one point, it caught on fire. Because of the fire, a lot of the containers got, fell off the side. Ship also released oil. Many of these containers contained these small plastic particles. Uh, next slide. This was in, uh, a very unfortunate event, and there was a lot of unknown and uncertainty. And by chance, I had a friend of mine uh, on the right-hand side, Lahini Alawahari, who's at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and she contacted me and said there was a lot of unknown and a lot of uncertainty in Sri Lanka going on. And there was a woman on the left-hand side, Asha DeVos, who's a PhD conservation scientist, who's a non-government organization who had a lot of questions. She was getting contacted by people in the response. She was getting contacted by the media. The folks were looking for her for advice. And uh, by chance, uh, I connected with her and I started to you know, provide some information to her. And she had mentioned to me that she could collect samples for me. So next slide. So I said, oh, collect them and send them to me. And so above is kind of a snapshot of what happened to the ship. And then the red on the right is all the areas that were contaminated by plastic. Eventually, three quarters of the Sri Lankan coastline was covered with plastic particles. Samples were sent to me. I got them about, um, about a week and a half after the event. We analyzed them. And what we found out was is that the pieces of plastic that were on the beach were the ones that weren't burnt, the ones that were on the container originally as well as ones that were burnt, that, um, that were burned, and then eventually found themselves on the beach. And when we did some really relatively simple analyses, we found out that the burnt pieces of plastic had a different personality. They behaved differently um, to the point where we thought it was in really important to share those results as best as possible. Now, typically when we think about sharing results, we think about writing a peer reviewed paper and we have tremendous amounts of certainty, but that takes months, sometimes years. So next slide. Again, these are what the samples look like. And in that panel right there was a piece of the burnt plastic. That wasn't a rock. That was pieces of those small white particles that burnt and then agglomerated. So next slide. So we had a decision to make. And there's a, I have this figure here that shows you that early on, a scientist, you know, when we start, when we get our first set of analysis in the laboratory, without much time, we have a certain amount of uncertainty, right? We haven't collected enough samples. We haven't thought about the results enough. Uh, and then with time, we get more and more certain. But the certainty that I need to publish a paper is very high, whereas the response community wants um, more, uh, is willing for less certainty. Okay, I'm gonna to cut to the chase, next slide. We were lucky, we collected samples and we sent out a fact sheet that went to the media, public, and the government and the responders. We did it, it wasn't peer reviewed, but it was informative. And this is what we wanna do, collect samples early, analyze them and share the results across. Next slide, we did get to publish the results about four or five months later, which is really fast, but not fast enough. Okay, next slide. So moving forward, it's very clear from Deepwater Horizon that, uh, next slide, that scientists who had a pre-existing relationship with the responders from Deepwater Horizon did the best science and had the best access early on. This is my point here, okay, next slide. But in order for you to be effective with all these folks, next slide, you have to know who they are and they have to know you. And the key point, next slide, is that, and there's a saying is, next slide, you can't exchange business cards at a crisis. It means you have to know these people beforehand in order for you to make the most significant outcome. Next slide. Um, next slide. Um, I talk a lot about this in a book I have coming out in about four or five months. So uh, shoot me an email if you wanna get on the list. Um, but at the end of the day, next slide, um, you just need to know people. And that's my advice. My Brazilian a former graduate student um, uh, translated that for me. But you have to know folks beforehand if you want to make a difference in both the response and the basic science of what happens early on during a spill. So 
Next slide for acknowledgements. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Dr. Reddy. It was a very important theme to be discussed. The third speaker is Dr. Paul Phil with a presentation entitled Advances in Chemical Analysis of Oil Spills. Dr. Philp has been an amateurs professor at the University of Oklahoma in USA since January of 2016. He was a professor of petroleum ge geochemistry at the University of Oklahoma, a principal research scientist at the CSIRO in Australia, associate researcher in chemis chemics at, at the University of California in USA, and postdoctoral postdoctoral mm -hmm. fellow at the University of Bristol, England. He earned his PhD from the University of Sydney in Australia and bachelor from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Paul Philp has research in interested in petroleum, environmental, and forensic ge geochemistry. So thank you, and the screen is yours. Okay, so uh, can you see the screen okay? No, we don't see your presentation, just... Oh dear. Not sure what happened to it. If well, you like, I can do it from my side, okay? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Save time. Okay, there we go. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give this presentation. Um, I always get nervous when I'm the last speaker in the uh, session because I wonder how much people have already covered of what I'm going to say. And I was asked to talk about advances in chemical analyses of oil spills. And uh, so when you think about what you mean by this title, it really covers two different areas because we can talk about analytical techniques and we can also talk about uh, how our knowledge of different compound classes uh, has advanced over the years. And so I want to cover a little bit of both. And so there's going to be a little bit of history in here and also some crystal ball gazing and also looking at some of the recent uh, developments that there have been in this area. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, now, you've already heard a lot of this, so I'm sort of preaching to the choir. But, um, you know, we've seen that oil spills can originate from a vast variety of sources, not just tankers and oil wells, but there are uh, wellhead problems, transport problems, storage tanks, and so on. Every spill is going to be a little bit different because it's going to, the characteristics of oils can be very variable. And of course, the environment into which the oil is, uh, was released will be different as well. So these oils can be highly volatile oils to extremely heavily, uh, heavily biodegraded oils. And uh, as we've heard in the last couple of talks or this morning, uh, we know how these characteristics will change over time, depending upon the oil, the environment, and so on. But the bottom line is that the analytical techniques that are going to be used to characterize these spilled oils will be similar in each case. And I think over time, with every major oil spill that's occurred, we have seen significant, uh, significant advances in our knowledge of what's happening to these oils. So if we can have the next slide, please. Okay, I like to, I've got two or three slides here of spilled oils because here's one that nobody's mentioned. This is the Torrey Canyon spill, which occurred in 1967 off the coast of Cornwall in England. Uh, this was a very large spill. 750,000 barrels of oil were released. That compares to 260,000 uh, barrels from the Exxon Valdez. So it was a very significant spill. But I love this picture on the right-hand side where you see the English with their very stiff upper lips using water and cans and various other things to try and clean up the spill. Obviously, that wasn't very successful. The, the British military was also involved here. They dropped a large number of bombs and petrol and napalm to try and burn the oil which was remaining on the tanker. That, again, wasn't very uh, successful. And so a large amount of the coast of Devon and Cornwall uh, and also France were affected by this very large spill. Um, oh, next slide, please. 
And then, of course, we've had the Exxon Valdez spill back in 1989. Tremendous amount of good scientific work was published as a result of that spill. And then more recently, in the next slide, of course, we've had the deep water horizon issue. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, you've seen a slide like this already. But my point of putting these in was just to mention that, you know, we do see significant advances <clears throat> in our analytical techniques and our interpretation of the data over time. Next slide, please. Um, so when we think about advances, what's really changed since the 1960s in terms of the analytical techniques? Now, in terms of the techniques, maybe not as much as you think. The basic tools that we use today, the basic tools are still the same. They're going to be GC, gas chromatography, and mass spectrometry. Now, of course, there have been some many major advances that have been made in these basic techniques. When I started off as a student many years ago, our GC columns were basically three feet by one quarter inch copper columns packed with a solid support and a liquid phase. Today, of course, we have these 100 meter fused silica columns and we have 2D GC. Mass spec has gone from uh, magnetic instruments, mass analyzers and electron ionization sources to multiple types of mass analyzers and uh, ion sources. And then we also now have uh, stable isotope analyses of individual compounds, which are a part of the routine fingerprinting toolbox that we have at our disposal. So if we go to the next slide, please. Just a couple of slides here to show you how things have changed. The slide, the top chromatogram that you see there is a chromatogram from the 1970s. Uh, here's pristine and C17. Well, if you, those of you that are analytical chemists realize that this would be totally unacceptable today because as we see in the bottom chromatogram, we can easily separate C17 and pristine. So our GC separation greatly increased over time. And on the next slide, now, of course, uh, 2D GC, uh, it's becoming a routine tool coupled with time of flight mass spectrometry. We've got the two dimensional time axes here with the uh, conventional time axis along the X axis. And then these time slices that are taken uh, over a short period of time along the Y axis, providing much greater resolution of these very complex humps that we see in oil related uh, samples. Next slide. Also, mass spectrometry. As I said, there have been major advances here. Uh, this is even before my day back in the 1950s. This is probably one of the first mass spectrum that was published. This is actually butane here, but these were re being recorded on um, oscillographs. Most people wouldn't even know what an oscillograph is these days, but it was a very crude form, but it was state of the art back in the 1950s. And then if we look at the next slide, we'll see state-of-the-art in the early 1970s. This was before computers were associated with GCMS systems. These are single-ion chromatograms with the terpenes and stearanes. This was the output here was on UV photosensitive paper. The resolution doesn't look very good, um, but again, this was state-of-the-art for the early 1970s. And if we look at the next slide, we'll see a typical stearane chromatogram uh, obtained by GCMS in, in recent days, much greater resolution, and of course, a much better understanding of all of the compounds, all of the isomers, all of the uh, epimers that are present in these very complex mixtures. So very significant advances in those techniques, but basically it's still GC and GCMS. Okay, the next slide. Um, so why do we need to characterize the spilled oil? And there are many reasons for that. And you've obviously heard a lot of this in the uh, talks that went before mine today. For litigation and forensic purposes, even though it may be obvious where the oil is coming from, you still need to prove that beyond reasonable doubt. And that's why we've heard that you need to collect these samples, you need multiple samples and so on, because what you also have to realize, and we heard this mentioned in a previous talk, that where a lot of these spills occur, there have been previous spills, or there might be oil seeps. 
or there might be uh, a lot of exploration activity going on in the same areas. And then we have the possibility of rogue releases, like the spill offshore Brazil that has been mentioned a few times, where nobody knows what tanker or when it re, uh, the release occurred, uh, it, at least they didn't know in the early stages. But by doing these detailed analyses, that information will become available. And then the, on the other side, we have to think about the impact of spilled oil, <laughs> excuse me, on the environment, the birds, the marine organisms, and other wildlife. And then we need also to monitor changes in this spilled oil over time. Because again, as we've heard, the composition of the oil will change over time. Certain uh, recalcitrant compounds will become far more concentrated uh, in the residual oil over time. Next slide, please. Um, now, we can... The advances that have been made in our knowledge of the chemical compounds or the chemical analyses typically will parallel the advantages in the or the advances in the analytical techniques. Years ago, we just used to look at uh, the normal alkanes in crude oils. This is way back in the, the 60s that I'm talking about now, uh, because by there was no combination GCMS at that time. And so those oils would have been characterized by GC. And the compounds that we looked at would have been the normal alkanes, and maybe if you were lucky, the isoprenoids. But with the advent of the combination of GCMS and then later the associated data systems, we started to use these compounds known as biomarkers. And these compounds were initially developed or uh, discovered, I should say, by the petroleum geochemists. A lot of the early work on characterization of uh, crude oils was done in the petroleum industry and academic institutes. And we're still finding new biomarkers that will provide us with useful information about the origin and history of the crude oils that can be used in an environmental forensics point of view as well. Um, also, I've mentioned that there have been many advances in ionization techniques and mass analyzers over the last 50 years. But it's interesting, and we've seen it in earlier talks, that most of these publications and discussions still center around hydrocarbons that extend up to C40. But hydrocarbons don't stop at C40. Uh, there, there's a wide range of compounds beyond C40, but they're not amenable to conventional, conventional GC analyses. You can see the presence of these compounds in this fraction of crude oil by simulated distillation, a boiling point distillation uh, technique that clearly shows compounds uh, present in crude oils and spilled oils present above C40. And uh, a lot of the photooxidation products and uh, biodegradation products are more toxic than the original compounds. And they may also be present in this fraction above C40. So on the next, let's go to the next slide. Oh, well, let's skip this slide. We don't really need that. Um, this is just backtracking. We'll get back to the compounds above C40 in just a moment. But I love this slide because it does relate back to the Exxon Valdez spill, but it clearly shows how a spilled oil can be impacted by uh, the presence of other crude oils that may have been spilled in the same area. On the left-hand side, you see the chromatogram of the Exxon Valdez oil. And above that, and also below it, you see three heavily uh, degraded residues that were collected by uh, Keith Quenbolden and co-workers at the USGS several years after the Exxon Valdez release. And on the uh, chromatograms on the right-hand side, these are uh, chromatograms showing the terpene distributions. And you see here in the top right corner, the chromatogram of the Exxon Valdez spill, a release, and then the three other residues. Now, isotopically, they're different. Here's the uh, Exxon Valdez oil, had a carbon isotope value of minus 29. One of the residues was minus 28.7, very similar. The other two were minus 24, uh, approximately. And then if you look at the, the 191 chromatograms, you see the two samples on the right-hand side, are, are differ from the Exxon Valdez oil, it, particularly in the presence of two compounds here, 
a compound called bisnorholpane, labeled B, and olina labeled O. They're in the two samples on the left, which were isotopically different from the Exxon Valdez, but not present in the Exxon Valdez oil. To make a long story short, these two residues were released into Prince William Sound in 1964 as a result of the large earthquake that occurred there, rupturing oil storage tanks that contained California crude uh, that was being imported into Alaska in those days. But clearly, those residues are still there, but they were easily distinguished from the Exxon Valdez oil. So again, just because the Exxon Valdez oil was the major source of the oil in Prince William Sound in 1989, it doesn't preclude other residues from being present. Okay, the next slide. Um, this, I'm just putting this in here because it was a nice slide. It was from a recent paper by Overton and actually published this year, but it includes a nice simulated distillation curve up here in the top right. And I wanted to show you this because you see the distillation curve here. Hopefully you can see my cursor, but it's going up to C40. That was about 89% of this particular crude oil. But then we've got another 10 or 15% beyond that. So these are high molecular weight compounds, which are not amenable to the conventional GC analyses. And if you look down here, we'll just mention this briefly, but these are three other uh, products that were characterized uh, in terms of their bulk composition. And if you look at this, they've got the C25 plus fraction here, you see how this varies in the, different, the three different samples that are present. So the message here is that all crude oils from different sources have different compositions. And the amount of the higher molecular weight fractions can be considerably different in different crude oils. So let's look at the next uh, slide. And so here we've seen a chromatogram like this already. This is the sort of conventional chromatogram that you see in many publications and here in many presentations, looking at the hydrocarbons going from the very low volatile uh, hydrocarbons going out to around C40. We've got our pristine and our phytane here as well. But if you look on the next slide, here's a crude oil. This is actually from Saudi Arabia. This sample's been <clears throat> analyzed by high temperature gas chromatography, where you can take the temperature of these columns up to around almost 500 degrees. And when you do that, you see a much broader range of compounds. In some cases, this one goes out to around C95. But you can get hydrocarbons in many crude oils going out to about C120. That's about the upper limit with these high temperature GC columns. And you're not always going to see such a vast abundance of these compounds around C50 or C60. But virtually all crude oils will have these longer chain hydrocarbons, which you uh, do not see by the conventional uh, gas chromatography. So the next slide. This is a, a diagram that was taken from a paper published by Heath and uh, some others back in the 1997. Uh, but I put this in here because it's relevant to the discussion about the high molecular weight hydrocarbons. They did a laboratory uh, biodegradation study on a, a very waxy crude oil that had hydrocarbons going out to C60 or C70. And just look down here at the last slide or the last chromatogram, after 136 days of incubation, we still see hydrocarbons going out beyond C40 out to C60, C70. These hydrocarbons are very recalcitrant. They're very resistant to biodegradation because although they're, you think of these as long chain uh, hydrocarbons, long chain normal alkanes, they don't sit there in the environment stretched out from one carbon to carbon number 70, they're sort of rolled up in a ball, basically. And it's very difficult for the bacteria to find the end of the chain to start degrading these compounds. So with these waxy crude oils, uh, you'll find a very resistant fraction that will remain after the oil has been in the environment for a considerable period of time. Okay, the next slide. Um, I've mentioned 2D, uh, GC, time of, with the time of flight mass spectrometer as the detector. 
Uh, and we've heard this mentioned in many other talks this morning and uh, probably yesterday as well. But what this has done is greatly increase the number of compounds that we can resolve in these very complex mixtures. I'm not going to read through all the comments on this particular slide, uh, just in the interest of time. But so there are two things here. First of all, it's increased the resolution. So we see a much greater range of compounds of certain families of compounds that would have been previously available by conventional, conventional GCMS. Uh, we've also identified, or I, uh, there are a number of unidentified compounds that were previously unidentified have become identified, including many photooxidation products. And as I've mentioned, these compounds are in many cases more toxic. Um, and then at the bottom there, if we couple the 2D GC with high resolution time of flight, mass spectrometry, it becomes even more powerful in terms of the compounds that can be identified. Next slide. So these are taken from some recent papers by Nelson and others at Woods Hole. Uh, this is just an example. This is where they were comparing uh, the uh, dibenzothiophenes in the Ixtoc crude in the Gulf of Mexico that we heard about on the previous slide with the deep water horizon uh, crude. The, the bottom line of this diagram is that the sulfur compounds were much uh, present in much greater abundance in the Ixtoc crude compared to the deep water horizon. But also by using the 2D uh, GC, not only did we see much greater resolution, particularly of the higher carbon numbered alkylated uh, dibenzothiophenes, but if we look at the next slide, you'll see that for these uh, dibenzothiophenes and the alcohol dibenzothiophenes and the chrysine th uh, benzothiophenes and so on, you see how we've, they've extended the carbon number range. As I said, co conventional GC, you'll see typically, let's say, dibenzothiophene and then maybe the C2, C3, and C4 uh, alkylated compounds. But now by using this 2D GC and the high resolution time of flight, we're looking, they're looking out to C22, uh, C22 uh, benzothiophenes. And similarly, with the other compounds that are shown on this particular slide. And if you look on the next slide, it's a similar deal with the nitrogen containing compounds, the carbazoles. Typically, you might see just the C1 and the C2 and C3 benzocarbazoles, but these ranges are being extended as a result of the use of the uh, G, 2D GC and the high resolution time of flight mass spec. So I think this is a very significant advance. It's showing us, telling us a lot more about the analyses, the compounds that are present, particularly in many of these uh, residues that remain after the oils have been uh, highly weathered. We go to the next compound, our next slide. Yeah, this is a slide that I found in a recent paper. The reference is over here in the bottom right. It's, it's a little, if you look at that quickly, it's a little confusing because they put retention times and they've got lines going down to the peaks. So the lines and the peaks get a little confusing there. But the thing is that what I wanted to show are these photooxidation products. If you look back in the <coughs> early literature, oil spill literature, I mean, going back to the 70s and the 1980s and so on, there wasn't as much attention being applied to photooxidation processes. Uh, but more, uh, more recently, as we've heard, and you can see in the literature, there has been a lot more work done on these compounds, which in many cases, as I've mentioned a few times, are going to be more toxic than the original hydrocarbons. So papers like this uh, present some significant advances in terms of the identification and the mechanisms of uh, photooxidation as well. So I, again, very significant advance. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so now let's just mention very briefly this term of Petret Petroleo mix, petroleo mix. Um, basically, to make a long story short, because I'm pro probably running a bit short on time here, um, what this is, it's basically sort of characterization of the whole oil using a variety of techniques, but particularly high resolution mass spectrometry with no GC or LC separation. And now I should also mention out mention that 
Things like this have been done before. If you look back in the 1960s, the oil companies were using high resolution mass spectrometry to characterize crudes at that time and create the so-called piano diagrams. And they were doing that with no GC separation because at that time, there were very few people that had a combined GC MS system and certainly not a combined GC high resolution mass spectrometer. But the bottom line is with these high res, let's go to the next slide. The bottom line with these high resolution mass spectrometers, and we're talking about uh, resolutions of 10 million now. A typical quadrupole mass spectrometer, if you're not familiar with how you determine the resolution of a mass spectrometer, a typical quadrupole mass spectrometer has a resolution of a few hundred. And here we're talking about separate uh, resolutions of 10 million. And what this means is that you can get very, very accurate mass determinations on molecular ions. And, you know, most people, unless they're told, always think, for example, that carbon has a mass of 12. Carbon doesn't have a mass of 12. It has a mass, an accurate mass of, I think it's 12.147. I can't remember exactly. But these masses are known very accurately. And so if you can measure the accurate mass of a molecular ion, you can get a molecular formula for that particular compound. So basically with these uh, Fourier transfer ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometers, you basically introduce the whole oil or whole residue into the ion source of the mass spectrometer, look at the parent ions, determine, determine the accurate mass, and then you get a, a, a series of molecular formula along with the number of double bond equivalents. And we've seen double bond equivalents mentioned on a number of earlier slides, and that enables you to, cut, to still have a fingerprint uh, looking at these compounds that are, uh, well, over the whole mass range uh, of compounds present in the crude oil, going all the way up to compounds that may have masses of over a thousand. Um, and this becomes very useful information because it's telling you more about the composition of the oil, is also providing you with another tool that you can use for fingerprinting the oil and comparing the original oil with the spilled oil. We go to the next slide. Um, these are the types of diagrams that you'll see in these reports that use this uh, high resolution mass spectrometry. And of course, I don't have enough time to explain all of this, but if you look over here, you see we're using this very high resolution uh, uh, mass spectrometer with a very strong magnet with a intensity of 21 Teslas, which are the units to measure magnetic strength. Um, you'll see that you, they've separated two peaks, one which has a formula of C55, H83, N1, and one carbon 13, and another peak, which is C53, H86, O3. Both of those compounds uh, would have the same nominal mass, but accurate masses are different. And so you can show that they have different molecular formers. And for these very accurate masses, there is only one unique molecular formula that there can be. Unique formula in the sense of the combinations of the carbon, hydrogens, nitrogens, uh, oxygens, and sulfur, and so on. And then one of the plots that you typically will see is a plot of carbon number against the number of double bond equivalents. So for all of these hundreds of thousands of compounds that they identify using this high resolution mass spectrometry technique, you'll come up with this sort of cluster diagram. And if two oils are very similar, then they will have very similar uh, qualitative distributions of those uh, very accurate uh, molecular formulas that have been determined in this way. Now, there's a lot more to this than what I've said there very quickly, and I've probably confused the issue significantly, but there are some good references. This is a fairly recent one in a relatively new book that has been produced or published. And so if you're interested in more information on this, and there's another reference here uh, where you can uh, get more information. So I've got a couple more slides. Uh, if we go to the next one. 
I did just want to mention briefly about stable isotopes because these have become this. Well, first of all, there's nothing new about stable isotopes. <laughs> stable isotopes have been with us since the 1940s, 1950s. But the big advance was when we got the combination of a gas chromatograph with an isotope ratio mass spectrometry, a mass spectrometer, so that we could determine the isotopic composition of individual compounds. Very useful complementary uh, fingerprinting tool for characterizing crude oils. This initially started off with determining the carbon isotope values. And here you see uh, uh, five oils that have had their normal alkanes and uh, pristine and phytane looking at the carbon isotope values. And you can see set some separation between these oils. And you would complement that with the biomarker data, the SARA analyses, and so on. And then more recently, well, not more recently, uh, after the carbon, we then were enabled, uh, it was possible to determine the hydrogen isotope values. And then more recently, using GC with uh, ICP MS, inductively coupled plasma MS, we've been able to determine sulfur isotope values. And we've also got nitrogen isotope values. So we've got these different isotope fingerprints, which can also be used for correlating or discriminating between oils and uh, from different sources, correlating the oil on the beach with the oil from the tanker and so on. Next slide. This is just one example of looking at sulfur isotopes of individual compounds. You've got the some volatile sulfur compounds here, dibenzothi or benzothiophenes, dibenzothiophenes out here. So each one of these compounds now has a sulfur isotope value associated with it. And if we look at the next slide, these are two examples of dibenzothiophenes of crude oils. And uh, you see the isotope, the sulfur isotope values over here uh, for similar oils. And um, you can see some differences in the sulfur isotope compositions of the dibenzothiophenes. So the references for these papers are at the bottom of each slide. So if you're interested in getting more information, that's where to go for that. And I think that's the last slide that make, if we look at the next one, I think it's a summary slide. Yeah. So, okay, I've, what I've done there relatively quickly is just try to show you some of the uh, advantages, uh, advances both in analytical techniques and also identification of different compound classes that have occurred over the last 50 or 60 years. I think it's great that we're seeing a lot more interest in looking at or work being done on the photooxidation products, which of course are causing a lot, have caused a lot of problems to the environment. We've got this uh, petroleum mix that allows us to look at these high molecular weight compounds and as time goes by, I'm sure we're going to get structures for a lot more of these very high molecular weight compounds above C40. Uh, the uh, uh, advance of the 2D GC with the high resolution time of flight is significant. The isotopes, I think, are significant. And personally, I would like to see more high temperature GC being used. It's not a routine tool. Uh, the techniques are there, a little trickier than conventional GC, but it does provide a lot more information on these compounds above C40. So I'll stop there, and uh, I guess we're going to be ready for questions. Thank you, Dr. Phil, for your considerations. Now the chair, Gabriele, Gabriele Melo Fernandes, will be conducting the participants' questions to the speakers. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending to our event. Thank you, Dr. Radovic, Dr. Reddy, and Dr. Phil for your presentations. It was very lightning. And I have some questions for the audience. The first one comes from uh, Karen Ibarra. From, she's a scientific researcher from Institute for, for Marine and Coastal Research from Colombia. She asks Dr. Reddy, what kind of mechanism of articulation like academia, government, society 
do you think needs to implement a region as Latin American or and the Caribbean to respond efficiently to an oil spill? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, presumably each, um, you know, each country or region has their own plans and, um, you know, they work accordingly. You know, for the most part, uh, the biggest challenge is, um, you know, having a developed plan. But at the end of the day, the biggest challenges to responding to oil spills is having a sense of a plan and then the logistics and infrastructure to support it. Um, you know, earlier this morning, one of the key takeaways was, like it or not, the Deepwater Horizon was not as bad as people thought. And the reason why was we were 20 miles off the coast of, of uh, New Orleans, where we had Deepwater ports, multiple airports, um, and an experienced folks know how to respond to it. So I think we have to keep in mind is, as well as having a planning and oversight, is an appreciation of our capacity to put people in place and to support them. And that's more than just technology, that's being able to feed them and uh, being able to house them or put them on a plane. So, uh, you know, I don't know much about the planning and oversight, but I do appreciate that any successful response is in many cases out of our hands in terms of our capacity um, to get people there and to make a difference. Okay, and she also asked, um... Does any USA state have an emergency response system for oil spills? Yeah, yeah, no, the, the United States um, has a very good, uh, I think a very good plan about how, we're, how oil spills are responded to. In part, it's all um, an outcome of the a 1990 spill. I mean, a piece of legislature called the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, or sometimes it's called OPA 90. And that set out a whole, there was already a, a sense of how oil spills are responded to, uh, but this is a sense that it's more nationwide about um, how oil spills are responded to. And there's a very sense, it's almost a military approach, although it's not run by the military, and it actually stems out of how fires, forest fires were being fought in the late 1960s and 1970s by, in California, the state of California. So a lot of way USA, and when a spill gets of certain size, um, a whole series of, of processes get in play and they're actually all born from how forest fires were fought in the late 60s and 1970s in California. Yes, uh, we think like here in Brazil, we have like this disaster starting in 2019, right? So mm -hmm. we had an um, emergency plan that didn't work, but we start to give importance to study this, to be prepared to this, to have uh, people knowing what to do when this happens. It's like you said, we don't have to give gift card, uh, visit cards, right? Yeah. yeah. We have to be ready to answer the problem. So yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, but, but just a reminder, that 2019 oil spill, was very very hard to respond to, <laughs> and you were at the at the you were at a very disadvantage of having the ocean currents coming and then bifurcating north and south. Uh, that was non trivial um, a response uh, because of the unknownness and the fact that the ocean currents were a, a, were playing a very hard, very hard to respond to. Yes, and and, and affected all the coasts of the northeast region, right? And it's. Yeah. Uh, it's huge, so it was really hard to respond, and we still is to make sampling and to study. It's we have to have a lot of collaboration, and that's why I think this event is so important because we can exchange and share information, and that's pretty amazing. And I have another uh, question from Professor Laesio from the Institute of Marine Science of Federal University of Ceará. He asked Dr. Reddy and Dr. Radovic, you have also worked on 2019 spill, right? From Brazil. Um, concerning the weathering effects, uh, which are the most significant differences between this Brazilian oil spill and the oil spills on the East Coast of the USA? 
and how these differences affect their environmental impacts. You can answer that, Yaros. Sure, sure. So I'm, I'm not sure which East Coast spills uh, the, the question refers to, but in general, what we observed with 2019 spill, uh, for example, compared to the Deepwater Horizon, at least the samples we analyzed, is less extensive photo oxidation, for example, which might be due to the fact that the, just the transport uh, of the oil was uh, was specific in a way that prevented extensive photo oxidation. So that's, I would say, a, a big, big difference there. In terms of impacts, uh, I'm probably, you know, I'm gonna say it's still an open question we would have to understand you know the impacted areas and, uh, and 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 how how the oil exactly affected them there were obviously some marine sensitive areas uh, that were in the pathway of the oil so i would probably focus on looking at uh, at those areas specifically uh, as as the highest priority so I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, in general, there was, I would say, less less weathering in, in, in compared to some other spills. Okay, thank you, Brother Rick. And Dr. Paul, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned some isotope an analysis of spilled oils in your presentation. What is the importance and application of this kind of analysis on spilled oils? Well, basic, basically, if you're sort of undertake or trying to figure out who is responsible or prove beyond reasonable doubt who is responsible, you want to use as uh, many fingerprinting tools as you can. And we've got the GC, we've got the biomarkers, and then we can also use the stable isotopes of the individual compounds as another tool for the correlation purposes to, to add to that uh, collection of data that will uh, hopefully be able to prove beyond reasonable doubt who was responsible. The, one of the drawbacks of the stable isotopes of the individual compounds is, as we know, that when oil is being weathered, of course, the initial uh, compounds that are removed are the normal alkanes. So it becomes a technique that's not going to work when you've got just a big uh, hump of unresolved compounds. Uh, if you can't see the compound that whose isotope composition you want to measure on the gas chromatogram, then you're not going to be able to get an isotope value for that individual compound unless you undertake a whole lot of separation and fractionation to get uh, a GC fingerprint that shows the compound. So basically, it's just it's another fingerprinting tool that will uh, hopefully support the data that you get from the GC and the GCMS and the other fingerprinting tools that you're using. Oh yeah, thank you. And um, we have an, uh, an, another question is about how to different how to differentiate urban chronic impact from oil chronic impact because we had we had many cities affected by the oil spill in 2019, and some of the the cities they were affected on the shore, but we have also uh, many impacts, anthropogenic impacts, like urban cities, like sea wash. And I think this would help, right? The carbon isotopes analysis to differentiate, differentiate this kind of input. Well, well, right. I mean, yeah, that's another area where you could use this. Um, again, first of all, you would have to figure out which compounds that you're gonna use as indicators of the urban impact or the urban contributions and determine whether or not those compounds that you're going to use as the urban signature were resolved sufficiently on the chromatogram so that you could see them uh, in order to be able to get the um, carbon isotope values for them. Um, and again, you know, the, as I said in my presentation, when we started, you could only get use the, the uh, carbon isotopes, but now we've got the hydrogen, the sulfur, uh, the nitrogen isotopes of the individual compounds. And of course, in some cases, although not quite so applicable to uh, what we're talking about here, but if you've got chlorinated compounds or brominated compounds, 
you can also use those isotopes of individual compounds as well. And some of those, the, the chlorine and the bromine, may be more applicable to the urban input, uh, input as well. Okay, thank you so much. And we have a last question um, for you three who, who feel, who wants to answer. <laughs> And how can we fasten the chemical analysis right after a spill to help to choose the better approach in dealing with it? You mean dealing with it in terms of cleanup? Is that what you're talking about? Or what they're asking? Yeah, I think is it. The cleanup, how, how to, to approach, like faster the, the approach of dealing with the oil. Maybe biota, biota, sediments, the impact on the shore. Do you, would you like each one of us to answer that? Who who wants? Can be you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Which was like know, a general I mean, question. Sure. I mean, when there's an oil spill, the responders have a toolbox, <laughs> right? They have a variety of tools that they can use to make a bad thing from getting worse, right? And sometimes it's just nature. We have dispersants, booming, burning, you know, and all these tools um, are most applicable depending on the type of oil, the extent of weathering, um, and the location, and all these factors at play. Now, how you can make a difference is if you have samples early on and you can measure them, you can test, for example, the efficacy of how well a dispersant is working. Or whether or not, um, when you want to in-situ burn, you have to burn it, you have to have some volatiles present. So uh, with sound chemical analysis early on, you can uh, make more well-informed decisions about what response tool you can and cannot use. So yeah, if you have sound science early on, you can help dictate a more effective, um, not necessarily always cleanup, but also just limiting the damages. How can you constrain and get less oil in places where it can create short-term and long-term injury? Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to make a final considerations so we can end our session? Yeah, maybe I can just follow up on, on the same question. I would add what was mentioned in a in, in couple of the talks is not only one, when the spill happens, I would I would highlight the need to conduct analysis uh, before, uh, before the spill happens to establish baselines, which are very important uh, to determine the source and all kinds of fate processes that we talked about. So it's, uh, it, it happens even before the spill. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that I think, you know, as, as these techniques continue to be developed, then obviously we're identifying more and more of these compounds that were previously unknown. And many of these compounds are, are toxic and have a significant effect on the environment. And obviously that's something that's going to continue. And we'll, ultimately we'll get a far better handle on the composition of, uh, of the crudes and as we've seen, you know, they're all going to be different, but we're going to use the same techniques for all of them, pretty much. Okay. Can I just add Thank one you. little follow-up? Sure. So, you know, this all comes back to the fact that after an oil spill, um, folks are moving fast. They might not have money. They might not have enough time um, or find the right uh, folks to analyze samples. My advice to people is collect samples, keep good track of them, and provenance and worry about it later sometimes. Um, sample, the, the knowledge encoded in samples is gonna disappear down the road. So my advice to people is, if you have an opportunity to safely and legally collect samples, collect them, keep track of them and worry about analyzing down the road. You can't rewind the tape. So that's, you know, and this all comes back for our, our opportunity to interrogate and understand from a variety of different platforms. But if you don't have samples to analyze, you can't do all this work. That's a great advice because it's timing is a, is a, is a matter, right? Thank you so much. And that's it for today. Thank you for attending our event. And let, I will leave with Luisa. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. 
Thanks to everybody for their contribution to this important discussion. So here we finish the online sessions of our spring school, and I invite you to our side event where students will present their research in oil. You can watch it by clicking on the link at the chat. Thanks to everybody. And a reminder for the students who will be attending to the students' training, you need to get to auditorium of Labomar at half past 1 p.m. in Brazil time. Thank you all for attending. We hope we, you have learned and enjoyed this edition of the school. And we will see you all again in, 2000, in 2013, next year, for the sixth Fortaleza Austral Spring School. Thank you very much. <laughs>